Good morning and welcome uh, to today's oversight hearing on the recent City Council report, Planning to Learn, the school building challenge uh, jointly sponsored by the Education, Finance, and Land Use Committees. We will also hear testimony today on a number of related bills and resolutions that I'll talk more about shortly after some opening remarks. And then we'll move on to hear from my co-chairs, uh, Daniel Drum of the Finance Committee and Rafael Salamanca of the Land Use Committee. The Planning to Learn report is the result of a commitment made by former Council Speaker Melissa Mark Viverito in her February 2017 State of the City speech to create a Council working group focused on improving school planning and siting in order to address widespread school overcrowding. This effort was led by then Education Committee Chair Daniel Drum and former Finance Chair Joissa Ferraris Copeland. We thank all of the three of, of them for their leadership on this critical issue, as well as our current speaker, Corey Johnson, for his ongoing support. The working group on school planning and siting consisting of staff from the Council's land use, finance, and legislative divisions met with education advocates, representatives of the School Construction Authority and the Department of Education, real estate experts, architects, and other professionals to better understand school space needs and the major challenges in addressing those needs in New York City. The working group also solicited input from the public through a web portal on the council's website to allow parents, teachers, students, and other stakeholders to inform the recommendations in this report. The Planning to Learn report provides an analysis of the space challenges faced by New York City's public school system and a comprehensive set of recommendations to address the ongoing and severe overcrowding that exists in many public schools. Overcrowding is a serious and chronic problem plaguing city schools. According to the latest preliminary mayor's management report in fiscal year 2017, 57% of elementary schools, 22% of middle schools, and 36% of high schools exceeded capacity and 53% of elementary and middle school students and 46% of high school students citywide attended an overcrowded school. There's also an increased need for new capacity due to the expansion of pre-K and charter schools as well as a push to remove all trailers from schoolyards. While school overcrowding is not an issue in every community, it is widespread and likely to get worse in the coming years without adequate intervention. The city is in the midst of a residential housing boom with new developments going up uh, in everywhere across the city, including many neighborhoods where schools are already overcrowded. In fact, the Department of City Planning estimates that New York City's population will increase by almost 10% to 9 million by 2040, including significant growth in the school age population. We recognize there are competing space needs in a city this large, but more housing means we need more schools. There's also a lack of coordination and planning across city agencies, which hinders the ability to proactively address policy goals, such as improving integration in housing and schools. Overcrowded schools shortchange students when specialized spaces like science labs, libraries, music, and art rooms are converted into regular classrooms. And when the only available spaces to provide services for students with special needs are hallways, closets, stairwells, in other makeshift spaces. Overcrowded schools often have large class sizes, which I'm all too familiar with as a former teacher in a very overcrowded school, New Utrecht High School. As a former teacher and advocate for lowering class sizes, I know that individualized attention and instruction based on each student's specific strengths, weaknesses, and challenges can be a significant factor in achieving academic success. But overcrowding limits the amount of time and attention an educator can devote to the unique needs of each individual student. As a result, students who need the most help fall even further behind as the school year progresses, while those students who are ahead of the curve fail to receive the advanced direction and materials they would benefit from. Research has linked overcrowding with lower student achievement and with increased stress, which can affect behavior, mental health, and motivation. Crowded schools are also noisier, which can affect children's attention and cognitive development and cause teachers to be less patient and more fatigued, leading to more teacher burnout. The SEA has made substantial improvements 
in the quality and efficiency of new school construction and has reduced the construction timeline for new schools from an average of 10 years to three years. Despite these improvements, overcrowding has persisted and new school construction has been unable to keep pace. That's why the Council is pleased to have published the Planning to Learn report, which calls for greater transparency in the school planning process and provides recommendations to help expedite new school construction as well as alleviate overcrowding in other ways. I want to express our gratitude to the staff from the land use, finance, and legislative divisions who participated in the working group on school planning and siting and whose hard work produced the Planning to Learn report. We hope this report sparks greater collaboration between the Council, DOE, SCA, and other city agencies as well as additional stakeholders in providing the best possible educational environments for New York City students. As I stated earlier, we will also hear testimony in a number of related bills and resolutions, including four bills and one resolution in the Education Committee, one resolution in the Finance Committee, and one bill in the Land Use Committee. Legislation in the Education Committee includes Intro 449, uh, sponsored by Councilmember Drum, which would require the DOE to post sub-district maps online. Uh, intro 461, also sponsored by Councilmember Drum, would require the Departments of Citywide Administrative Services to notify the DOE and the SCA when city-owned or leased property of an adequate size is determined to have no current use. Intro 729, sponsored by Councilmember Kalos, would require the DOE to post methodology and data for determining identified seat need. Intro 757, sponsored by Councilmember Gibson, would require the creation of an interagency school siting task force. And Resolution 289, sponsored by Councilmember Vallone would call on the New York City School Construction Authority to more clearly communicate to the general public how city residents can submit potential school sites and the guidelines used by the SCA in considering whether a suggested school site meets the evaluation standards used by the authority. Uh, as I mentioned, there is additional legislation in the other two committees, which chairs Drum and Salamanca will discuss. I'd like to remind everyone who wishes to testify today that you must fill out a witness slip, which is located at the, on the desk of the Sergeant at Arms near the, near the front of this room. If you wish to testify on any of the legislation, please indicate on the witness slip whether you are here to testify in favor or in opposition to the legislation. I also want to point out that we will not be voting on any of the legislation today, as this is just the first hearing. Um, and to allow as many people as possible to testify, testimony will be limited to three minutes per person. Because of time constraints, uh, questions from council members will also be limited to, to three minutes, and if time permits, we will have a second round of questions. Uh, now I'd like to turn the floor over to my co-chair, uh, the, the chair of the Finance Committee, Danny Drum, for his remarks, followed by the co-chair, Rafael Salamanca of the Land Use Committee. Thank you, Chair Traeger. Uh, good morning and welcome to today's hearing. I'm council member Daniel Drum, and I chair the Committee on Finance. I was proud to lead the council's work on school planning and siting with former finance chair, Jalissa Ferreras Copeland, and former speaker, Melissa Mark Viverito. And I'm excited to be co-chairing this hearing with Chair Traeger and Chair Salamanca. I look forward to today's conversation with our agency partners and working collaboratively to implement the recommendations of the council's report, Planning to Learn the School Building Challenge. Chair Traeger has already discussed the overcrowding crisis facing our city schools. As a former educator, I too know firsthand the negative impact of overcrowded schools and classrooms on the success of our students. This issue is of particular concern to me as my district includes some of the most overcrowded schools in the city. School District 24 and School District 30 face over, over utilization rates of 114 and 102 percent respectively. But this is not just a problem in my district. It is a problem citywide. This is why we are hoping to improve long-term planning and then back it up with sufficient funding for new seats. As finance chair, I would like to focus on recommendations in the Planning to Learn report that seek to shed light on the school planning process. The integrity and transparency of the formulas we use to plan for new schools is critical, since this is the basis for funding allocated for new school construction. We have made significant progress with the current administration on improving the data we use to determine school seat need, 
most significantly with the Blue Book Working Group, which made recommendations regarding the formulas used to calculate school buildings' capacity. When many of these recommendations were implemented, we got a more realistic picture of overcrowding in our city's schools, and as a result, we saw a significant change in the identified seat need in the DOE capital plan. The administration then invested more funding in the plan to construct an additional 11,000 K-12 seats. However, we still have a long way to go. Of the 44,628 seats funded in the current plan, almost 34,000 will be completed after 2019. This means most new K-12 seats won't be ready until years after they are needed. Last year, the mayor committed funding in the 10-year capital strategy for approximately 38,000 seats unfunded in the current DOE capital plan. While I applaud this commitment, it is evidence that the city is stuck playing catch-up. These seats are needed by 2019, but the funding is planned in fiscal 20 to 24. Based on current construction timelines, some of those seats will not be finished until as late as 2028. And of course, we can expect significant additional seat need by the final year of the next five-year capital plan, 2024 and beyond. Even if we were able to meet the current identified seat need, there are concerns about its accuracy. Data used in enrollment projections are unclear. The current method for calculating students from new housing is based on outdated information, and there are outstanding Blue Book work group recommendations that must be implemented to provide an accurate picture of existing capacity. In addition, the identified seat need is the result of adjustments the DOE and SEA make to the raw seat need, quote unquote. These adjustments take into account the DOE's non-construction strategies for reducing overcrowding, but these plans are not clearly communicated to the council or to the public. We need to know what these strategies are so we can hold the DOE accountable for their success in reducing overcrowding. The identified seat need should be a best projection of the number of new school seats and school buildings required to adequately accommodate all students. While we may not have the funding or capacity to meet this immense capital need in the short term, establishing a clear needs assessment for additional school seats will allow us to plan actually meet uh, that need in the long term. As Chair Traeger stated earlier, we will also hear testimony on a resolution in the Finance Committee, Resolution 286-2018, sponsored by Council Members Torres and Diaz, which would call on the New York State Legislature and Governor to grant New York City and any public authorities or public benefit corporations therein authority to utilize the design-build delivery method for capital projects. I would like to echo Chair Traeger's thanks of the Finance Committee, Legislative and Land Use staff who worked on the Planning to Learn report and supported preparation for today's hearing. I look forward to continuing the discussion with the DOE, the SCA, and other city agencies present that are crucial to ensuring we provide every student with the quality educational environment they deserve. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chair Traeger. Good morning, I am Councilmember Rafael Salamanca. I'm the Chair of the Land Use Committee. My colleagues have laid out the status of overcrowding and the significant challenges we face to resolve this problem in our schools. This council has led on this discussion by laying out a blueprint in the report we issued last month, Planning to Learn. I look forward to working closely with Chair Drum and Chair Traeger to take real action on addressing overcrowding in our schools and, and this hearing on the packages of bills and another step in this process. I also look forward to hearing from my agency partners how we can address the chronic and persistent overcrowding many of our neighborhoods confront, as well as planning for the needs of our future. As our report lays out, there are a number of districts where this problem has been a challenge for decades, and so the focus of many of our recommendations is really in these places where the need is greatest. Places like Sunset Park in Brooklyn, Corona in Queens, and Norwood in the Bronx, and Lower Manhattan at the North Shore of Staten Island, to name just a few. I think we all know that overcrowding challenges are not likely to get easier. As we expand pre-K and 3K, as our graduation rates hopefully improve, as our population grows, as land gets more and more scarce, we need to develop new solutions to addressing these challenges. The council report focused on three major areas. 
how do we do a better job of understanding what neighborhoods are growing and will likely see an increase in the number of school-aged children? Two, how do we do a better job at citing schools in the most overcrowded districts? And three, how do we build schools more quickly? We provide a range of recommendations in our report to help address all of these challenges from creating new initiative incentives for developers to build schools, to soliciting proposals for new school siting uh, from private sectors, to revising our methodologies and how we plan for new schools, to reviewing our design guidelines for schools. Much of this is very wonky and detailed work, but the big question we're trying to answer is how can we make sure that all children in New York have an environment to learn that maximizes their chances for success? In addition to a discussion of some of the broader challenges, we're also hearing legislation, including Councilmember Gibson's bill, intro 759. This bill will require applicants to DCP and DOB to indicate whether the applicant owns or controls a lot or adjacent lots which are subject to the application and meet the SCA size requirements for a potential new school site selection. This information will be referred by the relevant agencies to the president of the SCA for their assessment about whether the applicant's property is an appropriate site for new school construction. I look forward to the testimony on this bill today and how we can share information and coordinate our planning effectively across agencies and with the public. Before we start, I would like to thank council staff across the finance, legislative, and land use divisions who worked on the planning to learn report and who have helped frame the discussion for today's hearing. We have a lot of work to do as a city on this issue, and the solutions will require all stakeholders in the school's planning and construction process to be at the table. So I look forward to the productive discussion today on how we can move forward together. Thank you, and I look and I will hand it over to uh, Chair Traeger. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Chair Salamanca. Uh, so I recognize uh, our colleagues who are present, um, Minority Leader Matteo, Councilmember Richards, uh, Councilmember Rudenchik, Councilmember Cohen, Councilmember Rose, Councilmember Kalos, Councilmember Ku, Councilmember Gibson, Councilmember Reynoso, and Councilmember King, and Councilmember Lansman. Um, our first panel, uh, we have the Deputy Chancellor of the Education Department, uh, Elizabeth Rose, and the President of the School Construction Authority, Lorraine Grillo. Uh, before I ask you to uh, begin your remarks, uh, if uh, so, when I swear you in, if you could raise your hands, uh, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee or committees, and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Thank you. You may begin. Thank you. Good morning, uh, Chairs Trega, Drum, and Salamanca, and members of the Education, Finance, and Land Use Committees. My name is Lorraine Grillo, and I'm the President and Chief Executive Officer of the New York City School Construction Authority. I'm joined today by Elizabeth Rose, Deputy Chancellor for the Division of Operations at the New York City Department of Education. We are pleased to be here today to discuss our work and to address overcrowding and successfully planning new school capacity and the proposed legislation. Our mission is to design and construct safe, attractive, and environmentally sound public schools for the children throughout New York City, as well as modernize existing school facilities. The SCA was established in December 1988 to build new public schools and to manage the design, construction, and renovation of capital projects in New York City's more than 1,400 public school buildings, nearly half of which are over 60 years old. Following changes in school governance law in October 2002, management of the DOE's capital program was consolidated under one agency, the SCA, and functions that were once divided between different organizations are now integrated. To put this plainly, the consolidation and comprehensive approach to planning, siting, and construction has led to a dramatic reduction in overall duration for capacity projects, resulting in a shorter time frame for the completion of new schools. On average, the SCA can deliver a new ground-up school in three to four years, depending on size. An important part of our success is the partnership we have with the City Council. With your support, 
we are more successful in pursuing new sites. With your general funding, we are able to do more to modernize existing schools. We value our partnership and we believe that the collaboration, that collaboration is the best way to achieve success. We thank the City Council for its work on the recently released Planning to Learn report and believe that there are a number of recommendations that we can collectively work together on for the betterment of all of our students. Our comprehensive planning process includes developing and analyzing quality data creating and updating the five-year capital plan, and monitoring projects through completion. We have sought out opportunities to strengthen and refine our planning strategies, including the introduction of an annual amendment process and the identification of need at the sub-district level. We look forward to continuing the conversations on ways to better define and enhance our project process. In order to support our capital plan development, we undertake an annual review of our capacity, capacity needs analysis, which includes updating our enrollment projections. For this work, we solicit professional services from Stratis Statistical Forecasting LLC, a reputable demographic firm. These projections incorporate data on birth, immigration, and migration rates from various city agencies. Additional agencies provide statistics on housing starts and rezoning efforts, whether city-led or through private applications. These enrollment projections, which are performed on a district and sub-district level, help inform our need for new capacity projects. When compared to actual enrollment, our projections consistently take an aggressive stance towards growth. Over the years, our estimates have been between 1 and 2 percent over actual enrollment figures citywide. Using a broad range of sources provides a complete view of potential student demand. And the annual updates allows us to make timely adjustments when there is a sustained increase in student population in one part of the city or a decline in student popu population in another. This also in ensures that our projections accurately represent all of New York City and its nuances. Coupled with the work of our enrollment projections is a look at our existing portfolio and the capacity we will bring, be bringing online. For this work, we employ the latest data from the report on capacity, enrollment, and utilization commonly known as the Blue Book. As you may know, we exclude the capacity of all many buildings and transportable classroom units from existing capacity calculations. Public feedback plays a crucial role in our capital planning process. Each year, we undertake a public review process with community education councils, the city councils, and other elected officials, and community groups. We offer every CEC in the city the opportunity to conduct a public hearing on the plan, and we partner with individual council members and CECs to identify local needs. Your insights during this process are essential. We look forward to our continued partnership. It should be noted that the capacity program makes up almost 40% of our overall capital budget. The rest of the funding in the five-year plan is allocated to the capital investment program and the mandated program categories to cover infrastructure work in our existing building. Over the past two years, the city added over $1 billion to the five-year capital plan to build additional new seats in the most overcrowded and fastest growing neighborhoods. This brings the total number of new seats in the current capital plan to over 44,000 and total funding to the highest level of the highest ever level of approximately 16.5 billion dollars since 2004 the SCA will have opened over 145,000 new school seats across the five boroughs by the start of this new school year we know that our ability to site and construct new schools is critical to our success 
we thank Mayor de Blasio for his commitment to fully fund the current identified additional needs in the next plan and the Office of Management and Budget, OMB, for working with us to begin this process now. The next five-year capital plan will continue on the track of success we have had in our previous plans. In fiscal year 2005 to 2009, the SCA cited nearly 90% of the funded seats at the conclusion of the plan. We continued making progress towards our goal in FY 2010 to 2014 plan, where we cited nearly 80% of our funded seats. And like this current, current plan, we saw a funding increase mid-cycle. As of the February amendment, we have cited 31,807 seats and are working on additional new projects that will bring us to nearly 40,000 seats. The need for new schools is almost always linked to thriving and booming neighborhoods where vacant and unused space is uncommon. And here we face the tremendous challenge of finding sites that are large enough and suitable for building new schools. The SCA employs independent professional real estate brokers in each borough who are tasked with investigating listings and pursuing all opportunities for new seats. SCA real estate services staff works with our brokers in actively and constantly looking for properties throughout the five boroughs in areas of funded need to purchase or lease. The brokerage firms that currently have a contract with the SCA are as follows. Cornerstone Real Estate Services in Brooklyn and Staten Island. Newmark Knight Frank in Manhattan. Cushman and Wakefield in the Bronx. Saville Studley in Queens. In our discussion with various stakeholders, we have talked about the challenges in citing new schools and what we look for typically. These considerations, which are worth repeating here today, can be driving factors in whether a site moves forward or not. The SCA looks for sites that are at least 20,000 square feet for a new elementary school, but we will even consider small, smaller lots in areas of significant need, but they must be at least 12,000 square feet. The location and context of a site is also evaluated to ensure the appropriateness. Considerations are made for factors that include traffic conditions and adjacent uses that are not compatible with a school. Lastly, the SCA conducts extensive environmental review on each and every property being considered. There may be times when environmental challenges are deemed sufficient enough to remove a site from consideration. While finding new sites can be challenging, we approach siting in a comprehensive way that allows us to take advantage of unique situations. Over the years, we've developed a deep relationship with both the Archdiocese of New York and the Diocese of Brooklyn and Queens. Which we, with our shared mission of education, we've been able to transform former parochial school buildings into new homes for New York City's public school children. Over the last 14 years, this has led to nearly 15,000 new seats. Additionally, we have forged new partnerships over the past decade by working with developers on large-scale projects in areas of existing or projected overcrowding. These partnerships allow the SEA to provide new school facilities in areas of need with the developer providing dedicated land or space within the project. Over 5,000 seats within developer projects projected to begin during this five-year capital plan are funded for design or design and construction, including Hudson Square rezoning, Trinity Place Holdings, Hudson Yards in Manhattan, Cortona Park East, West Farms rezoning in the Bronx, Atlantic Yards, Albee Square, Greenpoint Landing, and Domino Redevelopment in Brooklyn, and Hallett's Point rezoning in Queens. Many of these projects are actively in design. Working with the, de with the Department of City Planning, the City Council, and developers, we have been able to take advantage of both city-owned and private property to secure sites for future schools. 
our engagement during both city-initiated neighborhood rezonings as well as developer projects has proven to be helpful in securing new school siting opportunities, such as parcel C and F in Long Island City and Queens and the Jerome neighborhood in the Bronx. We know our strategies have to be flexible in order to address the unique challenges of neighborhoods, and we know that eminent domain has a role to play. We have and will continue to use this resource appropriately and judiciously. In Sunset Park, we've been successful in keeping negotiations moving forward with the force of eminent domain, most recently with the former Seatown site at 4525 8th Avenue, and a parcel of land making up the former police precinct at 4302 4th Avenue. In these two cases, the SCA went so far as holding Article II hearings. In School District 20, through the use of eminent domain, we have acquired property at 59th Street and 3rd Avenue that will be home to a, a new 976-seat school. In Queens, we've exercised our right to threaten eminent domain most recently at Q419, the future home of a new 640-seat intermediate school. We are successful in pursuing new sites with your support. Take, for example, Chair Traeger, who suggested an existing school for an addition. This new addition at PS97 will add 468 needed seats. Working with Council Members Koslowitz and Gredenchek, we were able to successfully identify two new addition or annex sites in each of their districts, which will bring over 1,600 new seats. While these are great examples of our collaboration and partnership, we have seen too many good sites that don't become home to schools because the support is not there. We need everyone's help in ensuring these good sites become schools. Currently, over half of our overcrowded buildings are located in areas where we have funded new capacity in the FY 2015-2019 capital plan. New capacity is an important tool to tackling areas of overcrowding. However, resource constraints mean we cannot depend solely upon new capacity to address overcrowding. Cross-departmental hearings meetings happen regularly between the DOE's Office of Space Planning, the SCA, DOE's Offices of District Planning, Student Enrollment, and the Division of School Facilities, and superintendents to evaluate seat need and consider strategies to relieve overcrowding. DOE strategies to alleviate and address overcrowding include grade expansion, grade truncation, rezoning of elementary and middle school catchment areas, and conversion of inefficient spaces in existing school facilities. In an effort to build on this work, the Office of Space Planning is implementing a system to better track overutilization and monitor the strategies we are using to alleviate overcrowding. We know that non-capital interventions have a positive impact on overutilization. Working with community education councils, which have the authority to approve, approve zoning lines, and other community stakeholders, DOE has worked to reduce overcrowding by rezoning the catchment areas of elementary and middle schools. Since 2010-2011 school year, 244 elementary schools and 30 middle schools have been rezoned. For the elementary schools where the goal was to reduce incoming kindergarten enrollment to alleviate overcrowding, 94% was successful. Because rezoning only impacts the incoming grade level each year, the full impact of a rezoning is felt after six years for elementary schools and after three years for middle schools. DOE also uses existing underutilized space to alleviate overcrowding by reciting existing schools, by opening new schools and programs to attract students from overutilized buildings, or by creating additional capacity for different grade levels. With respect to the proposed legislation, we support the Council's goal for increased efforts across city agencies to address the challenges of finding and securing adequate sites 
for future school locations. We look forward to working with the City Council to ensure that any reporting requirements align with the information and data we currently capture and are available in our system. We have made great progress in our efforts to reduce overcrowding citywide, yet there remain pockets of overcrowding in our system. We know we have more work to do. We'll continue to target these areas to reduce overcrowding. The support of our partners in the City Council is paramount to this success, whether it's through your generous funding or through your support for our new school sites, all of our students benefit. We plan to continue that tradition of partnership and look forward to working with all of you towards the shared goal. Thank you again for allowing me to testify and we would be happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you. I uh, just want to note we've also been joined by Council Member uh, Constantinides as well as Council Member Adams and Council Member Rosenthal. Um, Okay, so I just want to ask a very simple question to start us off. Uh, Deputy Chancellor Rose, do you believe overcrowded schools negatively impact the school's ability to deliver quality instruction? Some of our highest achieving schools mm -hmm. are also schools that are overcrowded. And one of the uh, reasons that some schools are overcrowded is because of the quality of instruction. So. Um, clearly, in the ideal world, none of our schools would be overcrowded. Um, we do have schools that are extremely successful in spite of overcrowding. And are we ensuring that every student in that school is, is, is experiencing success or because success takes many shapes and forms? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, as a, again, you have former educators up here who know that because of large classrooms, uh, classroom, si classroom size and overcrowded experiences, um, it is very hard to provide that individualized, customized instruction when you have overcrowded uh, classrooms. And so, yes, there are some extraordinary resilient educators, resilient students, um, but there are some folks who need extra help and extra support, and it's very difficult to provide that support in very overcrowded uh, classroom settings. Um, I just want to kind of go, go into right to, to the coordination uh, between city agencies. Are there any, are there currently any formal processes through which the SCA is notified of available city owned or leased spaces that may be suitable for a school? Council member, we work very closely with uh, Department of City Planning and DCAS and the other agencies. Uh, a formalized process, I don't believe so, but certainly we have a regular communication with all of those agencies. And, and how would you define regular communication? Um, Any time there is a rezoning, uh, we um, are certainly at the table for those those issues. We are notified, for example, when when. Um, sites are available. We, under, we worked very, very closely with uh, city planning and DCAS on uh, the pre-K sightings, for example. Um, I'm trying to think of, of other, during the, um, during the siting process when we're actually going through that, those sightings, we work with those agencies as well on issues like the what's the surrounding community looking like and that sort of thing. So we work, we work very closely with all of them. So if I heard you correct, you're saying that these interagency discussions happen during, only during re the, the rezoning process, is that correct? No, we, we, are, we are, as I said, we are always in contact with, with other agencies. Because, we have a very good relationship with them. Because everybody. rezonings are very, you know, they don't happen everywhere, and they right. happen in certain neighborhoods, and, and not across all. And um, and I think that these types of this type of communication should occur regularly, regardless if, if there is a rezoning or not. Um, I know that we've also been joined by some other agencies here too. Um, so, for example, for uh, city planning here, I believe. Yes. Right. Um, if maybe if we can ask you to. Uh, Join the panel. Um, just like to swear you in as well. Uh, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before 
these committees and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Yes, and, and state your name, your title. I'm John Kaufman, the Chief Operating Officer of City Planning. Right, so uh, do you work with DOB, HPD, EDC, SCA on school siting planning and decisions? Uh, yeah, we work with all those agencies regularly on a variety of issues, as you say, both related to rezonings and more broadly. And we work very closely with the SCA and DOE on the school's issue. Is there a particular staff person or staffers within city planning when they come across a number of land use applications or zoning applications where there is significant density being added to a certain neighborhood? Is there someone charged with the responsibility in your agency to flag this for SCA, DOE, and other agencies? Yeah, I mean, there's a couple ways to answer that. One is that we're always thinking about that. Whatever we think about rezonings is the level of city infrastructure in place. And indeed, with SCA, it's quite important they understand as soon as possible when, we're even think, when we even hear about something possibly happening in those areas. So it's all of our planners are on guard for that kind of activity. In addition, the, the seeker analysis itself makes sure that we do think about all sorts of city services when we go into rezoning by law. And that's something we have people that are technically qualified to, c to compute the seeker analysis and provide an actual specific answer to the degree of impacts. And we pass it on to SCA as soon as we have it. But during the course of a rezoning process or, or your process, uh, if it's determined during that process that there is significant need for additional school seats, but the zoning ultimately does not get approved by the council, does the does the school still get constructed? Does the city does the city agency still say we have to build the school regardless of the zoning passes the council or not? If it doesn't, if there's no zoning change or no uh, change to density projected from a development, that's it would fall just in the normal remit of what SCA looks at, which involves all sorts of projections about the city and, and students, which uh, I'm sure you're familiar with. So city planning's role is not you know we look at ULIPA specifically, and that has obligations for us to pass along. If it doesn't pass, it's in the general course of discussions we'll have with them about what we see happening in the city. Right, but my question is, during the course of the, of the UR process, you, you, you come across data and information about density in that neighborhood, about potential school seats. Is a decision made at that point to say, look, this neighborhood clearly needs additional schools. We have to do this with or without this UR getting final ah, approval. Well, that, yeah, and that data is already in the underlying information that we share. So that's nothing newly discovered there. It's a part of the ongoing dialogue. But that information seems to be only viewed during a UR process. I'm not sure if it's viewed in a regular process because we haven't seen any, ev any evidence of that. I, I might let uh, SCA comment yeah. after this. I, I would say that, it, that, again, these ongoing discussions we have already always present them with what we, we think is happening in these neighborhoods, which is a regular ongoing activity. And that would be the same information that's drawn into ULERP um, if we get to that specific, if there's a specific rezoning to be considered. Well, let me ask it this way. Is there, is there a deputy mayor or another lead staff person who coordinates between all these agencies? Who do you, who, who, who do you have to answer to? Who's in charge of overseeing all this? <laughs> um, I, well, actually, in this particular situation, I mean, I report to the first deputy mayor. So, um, you know, I don't know. We all work very closely together, though. Right. And so... That's first deputy mayor? Dean Fulan. Dean Fulan, okay. Um, and so can you outline, uh, to the extent that you can, the formal process in which SCA engages um, the city agencies when a large city-sponsored project is being considered? Can you just walk us through that process? Again, we do, to start with, yeah. we do our, our enrollment projections on a yearly basis, okay? so we already have, as John said earlier, we have that information for those districts that are either potentially getting a rezoning or not, or ULARP uh, application. If it's an overcrowded district already, we certainly pursue new sites, whether or not that particular ULARP application passes or not. Um, if it's an underutilized area, we are certainly, and it's not overcrowded in any, any of the schools, we are not looking for a site. But we do that as a normal course of business for our projections. Right. 
And so, for example, in the Department of Buildings, when they come across a significant number of permits yeah. that are being filed to you know, construct additional buildings to add, add more density, is there, are there, is there communication happening? Absolutely. We, when Can we, you explain that? When we're doing our projections right. of, first of all, our demographer is doing, are doing their particular projections. On top of that, we also go to the Department of Buildings every year, and they give us information on, on permits and, and whatever's coming up in terms of housing. City planning gives us information on potential rezonings and potential applications that are coming up. We have all of that. We, gri we pull that information together when we're doing our, our plan. Right. Um, to, so now, is the SEA open to the uh, Council's recommendations around improving and formalizing interagency co uh, coordination to assist in the siting of schools? And to be more direct, <laughs> does the administration support Intro 757 requiring the creation of an interagency task force? The SEA actually supports anything that will uh, will assist us in siting schools uh, where they're needed. Um, on the individual res resolution, we are certainly open to uh, participating in a task force. So you're in support of the task force creation? Sure. Um, okay, that's good. Yeah, <laughs> we're fine. Does the DOE support it as well? Similar to SEA, we support anything that helps us site schools in difficult to identify areas. Okay. And, and to what extent is the DOE involved in determining whether a site or a space is suitable for a school? So in determining whether a space is suitable for a school, we defer to the school construction authority. There are some times when uh, Lorraine will you know, identify a location and we'll have a conversation, but for the most part, um, once we've identified collectively the need for a school, SCA is responsible for finding the best site possible. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm gonna have one more and then I wanna be uh, cognizant of my colleagues is here as well. There have been repeated instances where communities and council members have brought sites to the attention of SCA which are then used to site schools, but which were not identified by SEA's brokers. How does SEA evaluate the performance of its brokers? Well, I think it's important to know that our brokers are paid through commission, okay? So I think what, what's important about that is obviously if they're not doing the job, they're not getting the commission. But we go out with an RFP um, every, I believe it's every three years. Uh, we've had enormous success with our brokers, but again, it's always important to work with the folks on the ground, okay? The people that live in the neighborhoods, the people that get the information that says, we believe that this particular factory, for example, is going to be sold, but has not yet hit the market. So those are the things that are very, very helpful to us. Um, give you an example, Council Member Drum uh, was able to give us information on a, a particular company that was going out of business and we were able to grab that piece of property before anyone, anyone else was interested and now we're building a school there. Do you have a, uh, could we have a copy of the RFP for the brokers? Sure. Uh, would would like, like to see it. And how many brokers do you have? In Four. Total? F Four? Four currently. C citywide? Uh, one in each, well actually, a Cornerstone, um, one of our brokers is in Brooklyn and Staten Island, uh, Newmark in Manhattan, Cushman and Wakefield in the Bronx, and Saville Studley in Queens. Now, do these workers work exclusively for the SCA? No. So even if they're paid commission, they're still earning a salary somewhere else, is that correct? That, I believe so. Right, so yeah. if they don't find a school, they're, they're working somewhere else, and that's, that's how they're supporting their, their livelihood. Um, how many of the sites in the current capital plan were identified by brokers rather than members of the public or elected officials? I'll have to get back to you on that. I, I, I don't have that information. That would be very, very, sure. very helpful. Um, and uh, what percentage of potential sites for capacity projects identified by SEA's real estate division are, are actually used? If I'd have to, if 
I had to take a guess, I would guess that probably 60 to 70 percent of those. Right. Uh, it, it's it, there is a concern, and I, I don't think we're questioning the 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 quality of the, 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 the staff, it's, the question is the capacity, mm -hmm. whether it's enough, and do you believe that there are, there are enough folks dedicated uh, in, this, in this particular area to, to find sites and to actually acquire them? I, um, I think I mentioned this at our last hearing. I would never turn down additional staff. It certainly would always be helpful, but I think that our folks in our real estate division do an extraordinary job how many would you say you, you would need to uh, improve performance? I, I don't believe that we need any more to improve performance because I think our performance is pretty darn good. Um, but I will say it would probably make some people's lives a lot easier because they work very, very hard. Right. But if I, I appreciate your candidness that you would welcome more help. Sure. So it would help us from, from an advocacy point of view and policy making point of view and a budget point of view to know how much more help you need. Again, I, I, I want to say that at this particular point, do I feel that we need more people to do this particular function? No, I feel that our folks managing those brokers get the job done. Right, well, to follow up, I've been asking for, I think, years uh -huh. and haven't received a thorough response about who made the decision or how was the decision made to give PS 248 in my district over to the MTA Sweet. in an area that the DOE and the SCA know is extremely overcrowded. And again, as, as I've, I think I've said before, yes. this happened well before the SCA was involved. Right. And so who... You know how do we how do we hold folks accountable for the for these types of decisions? If if that's even again made today, how I, do we hold folks accountable? I can I can only say from experience that um, way back in the 70s, when the city was going through a fiscal crisis, it sold off a number of underutilized school buildings, and I can tell you this was well before the SCA was created. When we were created, and after a period of time, we paid a tremendous, oh, by the way, they sold off these properties for a dollar, and we had to buy them back for many millions of dollars in those areas where we needed them. Um, again, I don't believe that the SCA, since its inception, has sold off a piece of property. I think, if I recall, and if I'm correct, there were two pieces of property that um, were given over to DCAS because they weren't being used, and the cost of rehabbing them would have been astronomical. Well, I know my co-chair has a bill in relation to DCAS. I'll turn it over now to, to the finance chair for, for this. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Traeger. And uh, it's good to be back here at an education committee hearing, joint with the other committees as well. Um, yeah, I, I, I just wanted to, a, a thought off the top of my head is that in terms of your testimony, um, President Grillo, as well, I noticed several times you say the citywide um, numbers and I think what we're trying to drill down on here is, because I do congratulate you on your citywide efforts. I think overall, the SEA has done a good job. Thank you. Where we find the problems are in pockets where we see tremendous problems with overcrowding and somewhat the inability to catch up with that overcrowding. Uh, so as a follow-up to what Council Member Traeger was saying, um, what I don't understand, and maybe this is really for city planning, is that uh, when we have large developments planned, like one in a neighboring district to mine, um, of 5,000 units of housing or more, initially there was not even going to be a school there. Then the council members, over the course of the history of this site, fought and they got one school, an elementary school. Okay, so it's 400, 500 seats for an elementary school. But my question is, like, what happens after they leave elementary school? So do we take into consideration, like, what happens? Where do they go to middle school? And then I guess high school, they move around on their own. 
but there's definitely an impact, especially in like a district like 24, where mostly they go for the zoned junior highs, if I'm not mistaken. So what happens in that process? Because I think that's partially to blame for the breakdown. <laughs> okay. Um, I think that, uh, forgive me, but if you're talking specifically about the Long Island City uh, area. No, I was talking more about Willits Point, actually. Oh, Willits Point. But it's going to happen in Long Island City as well. Right. Th these are concerns right. that I see. And, and right. Long Island City is 30. Willis Point to 24, right. two of the most overcrowded districts. I, again, in, um, first of all, in the Willis Point area, as you said, we are planning for an elementary school in that area. Um, Queens high schools generally have been overcrowded for many, many years, and we're constantly looking for seats. But we cite high schools borough-wide. We're not citing specifically to that particular Willits Point area. It would be great to do that if we can, but we know we have a seat need for high school seats in that area. So, I was talking about junior high school seats, oh. intermediate schools. Did I say high school? I'm sorry. That's okay. Yeah, um, that's really one of the areas I think where we have some problems. Where do those kids go, especially in, in, in 24? Because they're going to go into, in, in that particular site, they're going to go into IS-61, which I believe is already overcrowded. Right. Well, well I don't know that the Willits Point area would be they, dry. Well, they wouldn't go across the line, which is District 25. Yeah. Uh, school District 25. All right. I, you know, I'd have to get into, to get into specifics. I'd have to really take a look at that. I'm sorry. Uh, and I, I just want to well, add to you. Actually, Chair Drum, if I could add, this is a great example of where we also use non-new capacity strategies to help address demand. So you raised IS-61 in, in District 24. Um, that's a school where we actually relocated a program to another school to allow for the growth of the zone demand for that school. Um, so there are the capacity needs taken into account as we do the annual projections. So the 5,000 apartments would generate some number of elementary seats and some number of middle school seats needs, which are accounted for in the annual enrollment process. And on top of that, we work to identify non-capacity strategies that can also help address. Right, and there was some controversy around removing that G&T program from 61 over to 73. But, um, you know, I, I, I just don't see, and, and, and this is really, I, I, I would like to hear from city planning on this. What, how do you take this into account, building one school, but then not taking into account for the middle school needs? Uh, again, I mean, the, as you know, the capital plan is, you know, SEA is the owner of that overall. I'll say that, you know, we give them, you know, regularly these dialogues about where we see new units coming in and try to give them additional input as asked for it, specifically when you're dealing with a, a rezoning where there may be more dynamic movements happening. Um, in the enrollment projections, you know, I know that their detailed enrollment does think about how those kids progress through grades and that's part of their overall capacity planning. Well, look, I hear what you're saying. I know that you moved the um, g and program out of 61, and, and, and it's a local example, but this is, I think, citywide as well. But maybe you're moving out of the g and program 200 kids, probably at max, but you've built the school for 450, 500, so where did the other 300 go? And I would really urge, as we move forward in this discussion, that we begin to look at issues like that. Um, uh, I think that is really important to uh, this discussion. Uh, let me move on a little bit. Um, is there any rule of thumb for the number of apartments uh, that would be developed in terms of the number of schools that would be part of a development? That's you. <laughs> Sorry. So in other words, if, if you're building 5,000 units, is there any type of an estimate that city planning uses to say, okay, 5,000, you need a school for 500 kids, or you need a school for 500 elementary, you know, 500 middle school or whatever? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So again, our in, our input's limited to the number of units, and that information is handed over regularly to the SCA, and they work again with their demographers. and, and Lorraine may talk and a more about so that. And so, what is that rule? No, we just give the, we just forecast units. We don't forecast. So, so if you get five thousand yeah. units, how many seats, school seats, would you need? I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. We have a specific um, housing multiplier that we use. I. I I don't have the figures in front of me, but certainly we use a particular multiplier to generate the number of, of uh, seats. 
Okay, let's, let's also, when we meet further on this, discuss sure. that formula because sure. I think that's really important to the discussion. Uh, the public has a, vest a vested interest in the sub-district lines since this is the level of geographic planning to which uh, funding for new, new school seats is used. We appreciate the SCA sharing sub-district maps with the council, which are allowed um, up to prepare the map shown here. I believe it's up there on the, on the, on the um, television now. But data on school district and uh, school zone lines are, are um, publicly, they're not publicly um, available. Why aren't the sub-district lines um, similarly made available to the public as the district lines? Well, <clears throat> we have actually seen the legislation that um, would require that. We have no issue with that. We're certainly willing to do it. Okay, good. What is the origin of the sub-district lines in the SCA uses to determine identified um, seat need? Is there a mandate that these boundaries be um, coterminous uh, yeah. with school district lines? We, we are both um, kind of perplexed because these sub-district lines were created long before uh, SCA existed and, and they predate both of us. So uh, do they need to be coterminous with district lines, do you know? But they're within district lines, certainly. Uh, not always. If you take an example in uh, Jackson Heights where you have um, school uh, addresses that are um, in District 30, but their kids are going to District 24 schools. So that's, yeah. that's not actually a, a sub-district uh, line issue. That is a zone. Uh -huh. And so some of the school zones did predate uh, the division of the city to uh, 32 districts. Um, and there are in many locations uh, school zone lines that cross district lines. In, in general, that can be a very positive thing because it allows for some diversity as you may have very different neighborhoods right at those district lines. How long ago was the last rezoning? So I think you're asking about redistricting well, rather both. than rezoning. Right, re we rezone elementary schools and middle schools on an ongoing basis um, as we determine need, and that need can be driven by right. um, the opening of new capacity, which creates an opportunity to rezone so many I mean, adjacent I mean schools. More, when was the last redistricting? So the last change in districts, I think, was the creation of District 32, which goes back about 20 years or so, maybe longer. 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 And before that, it was what, 50 years? Um, before that, 68? it would have been 1968. 68. Most likely. Okay. Um, does the SCA have the authority to change um, the sub-district lines, the boundaries? The sub-district boundaries? I, these have been historic boundaries. I think what I, the SCA would not change those. Those are DOE sub-districts. However, as the Deputy Chancellor mentioned, uh, the DOE regularly does their own rezoning within that sub-district. Would there be and any? and in in some cases, um, they've actually uh, worked a situation where you have two districts sharing a particular school together. I Would know there be any people. cost associated to um, to the process? So the process of redistricting is actually pretty complicated. Um, it requires it, it's described in Section 2590B2C of Education Law. I'm amazed I managed to get to this page. Um, it requires us to uh, draft a plan describing proposals. Um, it requires us to hold public hearings in all boroughs to gather community feedback. Um, then potential revisions to the plan and additional public comment. Uh, and it would then have to go to the vote for the Panel for Educational Policy. There are a couple of interesting things about the law. Um, for example, the law requires that the boundaries of District 10 may not be changed, yet District 10 is one of our most overcrowded districts, um, and so it, it, redistricting won't help us there. Um, in general, we think that the ability to use school zones, to have districts work uh, across 
uh, district lines where we have opportunities, like in District 13 and 15, where we have, uh, we, we built new capacity located in District 13, but intended to help address overcrowded in District 15. And so we've created a school that serves two districts, uh, and the CECs have worked together uh, to do so. So there are many strategies we can use um, at the local level that doesn't require a full redistricting process. So would the DOE be willing to change sub-district lines? So I think that's something um, that we can discuss. Um, again, the, the sub-district lines uh, really help to localize analysis, um, and because they do cut across neighborhoods, it also helps us um, to use um, adjacent schools to potentially address overcrowding in a very local area and, and use our space efficiently. Okay, uh, let's go to our next uh, chart there. Uh, the New York State Contract for Excellence, C4E. Uh, e. Law requires New York City to include a class size reduction plan for all grades, but New York City has still not met the agreed upon class size reduction goals <coughs> established in 2007. The Blue Book's target class sizes for grades 4 to 12 also remain above the city's reduction goals, are in fact above the <coughs> existing average class sizes as shown in this graphic. This means DOE is planning for schools with larger sizes than they currently exist, rather than planning to reduce class sizes as mandated by the state. Uh, will you begin to reduce uh, Blue Book class size targets uh, for grades 4 to 12 to the C4E goals? as has already been done for grades K to 3? Well, I've certainly, we've certainly worked closely with the Blue Book Working Group on some of the issues that, that you're talking about. Um, it may be mandated from the state to go for the C3 goals, but it hasn't been funded by the state uh, to move forward with C3. So um, as much as this, we would love to do this, there's just not enough money. So. That's something that the state mandated without the funding to support it. But we will continue to work with either our working group or the, the Blue Book working group on this issue. I'd like to add um, to what President Grillo said. In middle schools and high schools, the Blue Book formulas actually, you know, we, target, we say our target class size is 28, but the actual Blue Book formula only counts a classroom for a certain number of periods a day. So the capacity contributed by a classroom, a regular classroom for a middle school, is actually only about 24.5 students. It's very close to the C4E goals. So in, in that way, many ways, the Blue Book capacity is actually very aligned. Um, so it, the count of that classroom um, is only about 24 and a half kids. That's what it contributes to capacity. So if where we see class sizes um, actually lower than um, C4E um, regulations, are you willing to reduce, are you, are, are you leaving those class size, those, those those numbers the same in anticipation of increasing enrollment? I'm sorry, I'm not following the question. Right, your actuals are lower than the blue book. Mm -hmm. It makes us wonder mm -hmm. why the blue book is remaining at that number. So the, the blue book is our assessment of capacity. And so if the class size that is actually in that classroom is 18 students instead of 20 students, the capacity remains 20 students. But you could still go higher in that room, is that it? That's correct. But then you would But then if, you would if feel the class size is higher than that 20 students, uh, you'd likely see that the, the utilization of that building is over capacity. So uh, the rapid rollout of UPK demonstrates the SCA's ability to quickly construct thousands of additional school seats with the right political will. Mm -hmm. Almost all the uh, pre-K seats funded in the current five-year capital plan have been completed, while the majority of the K-12 seats funded in the plan will not be completed until after the plan has ended. 
perhaps due to the rapid rollout of UPK, no formal process for identifying pre-K seats um, need exist. Uh, this is particularly concerning given the rollout of 3K for all and the existing challenges planning and citing K to 12 seats. So will the next five-year capital plan include a formal identified seat need for pre-K, including seats uh, for three-year-olds as appropriate? Well, we work very, very closely with um, uh, DOE's early learning group on the pre-K. I think there are a couple of things. I think um, they are um, consistently looking at the numbers as far as the pre-K is concerned. Um, the formulas are different because pre-K is really um, borough-wide. So, for example, if I lived in Queens but worked in Manhattan, I have the right and the ability to register my child in Manhattan. So it's, it's a little bit of a complicated process. So we, we know the formula is different. Yeah. But we want to know a little bit more about how you go about the process of citing those seats and will you include that in future projection and need for UPK seats in 3PK? Um, well, yes, certainly. But again, the numbers for the locations and uh, really are coming out of early childhood at DOE where they are uh, doing a deep dive into where those needs are. So certainly we're happy to, you know, report the information that we have uh, in, in, the, in the Blue Book or in any formula that we can. Can the DOE also speak to that process? So, <clears throat> obviously we get a tremendous amount of information from the enrollment process. Um, families apply online, they can rank uh, many choices, both in their district, outside of their district. Um, so after each year, um, the Division of Early Childhood reviews the application uh, trends effectively of where families live, where they are applying to school, and feeds back information to school construction authority of where they believe they will need additional pre-K seats in the following year. Let's go to the next slide then. Uh, the capital plan currently projects identified seat need only through the, fifth, uh, the final year of the plan, which means that the identified seat need is, uh, is as of 2019. However, as shown in the slide, the majority of the K-12 seats funded in the current plan will not be complete until after 2019. This means a, a SEA is playing catch up, constructing seats that may have been needed for years even as the identified seat need grows. One of the report's recommendations is that the SEA projects seat need for a rolling 10-year period in the capital plan. We believe that this would allow the city to plan actual need uh, actually meet the need in the long term rather than continually, continually projecting an unachievable seat need in the fixed five-year periods. How are long-term seat need projections currently accounted for in the DOE's capital plan? And again, we update those projections every year, okay? So we look forward for those additional years. Each, each year we update it and we move forward another year. The five-year uh, capital plan, we are mandated by law to do, to do in that way. So, um, you know, we are comfortable um, by the end of this plan, you will have the next five years out, you will know exactly what it is. And we're in the middle of, at this point, uh, we're close to beginning to create the next five-year capital plan. So those projections, again, are updated yearly. So we're going out further every year. So in the report, it's recommended that we have a rolling 10-year plan. Would you be, working, would be willing to work with us on that 10-year plan? I would like to, but again, we are mandated by law to have a five. Our legislation indicates a five-year capital plan. And you can't go beyond that? Um, it would certainly be um, an enormous task. We are set up 
in our systems and in our analysis for a five-year capital plan. Okay. Um, all right. Let me, we'll talk more about that, I'm sure, offline. But uh, let, me, let me ask, is DCAS here? Representative from DCAS? Yeah, can I uh, have, uh, have them come up and would you swear them in? Okay, uh, if you could raise your right hand. Uh, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before these committees and to respond honestly to council member questions? I will. And if you can just uh, state your name, your title, we appreciate it. Thank you. Sure. Laura Ringelheim, uh, the Deputy Commissioner for Real Estate at DCAS. Okay, thank you and welcome. And um, a lot of times people in the neighborhood come up to me and they say, you know, very simple thing like, um, you know, what about city owned land? Does um, uh, DCAS share that information with SCA and with the DOE on a regular basis? We do. We uh, routinely reach out to agencies and have agencies reach out to us all the time to find out what land we're holding in our portfolio that might be available to them. Is there a formal process for the um, distribution of that information? I wouldn't say it's a formal process. I think agencies know where to go when they need this information, so we get inquiries routinely. Um, I, yeah, I wouldn't call it a formal process, but it exists and is well. So, President Grillo, do you communicate with them on a regular basis? We certainly do. As a matter of fact, as an example, uh, we work very, very closely with DCAS during our effort for uh, UPK. Yeah, we, we just got an inquiry two weeks ago for uh, 3K from, from DOE and are conducting a site search now with them in the catchment that they're requesting. Is that information available to council members as well? Absolutely. Where is that? So some of the information is on open data, but we can certainly provide a list of properties that are uh, vacant. I think we that routinely provide it to different members of council upon request. It would be very interesting for me to see also. Absolutely. All right. Thank you. I thank you for your uh, time, and I'm going to turn it back over to the chair. Thank you, uh, Chair Drum. Just want to also recognize that we've also been joined by Councilmember Miller, Councilmember Lander, and Councilmember Van Bramer. And now I'd like to turn to the co-chair, Chair of the, the Land Use Committee, uh, Chair Salamanca. Uh, thank you, Chair Traeger. Good morning. Um, how long does a siting review take? Uh, let's say a piece of land is identified by the mm -hmm. broker. How long does that process take uh, for the SCA to determine this is a suitable site for a school? Well, there are a number of things. We certainly uh, have our architects uh, review the site, review the topography, review the, uh, the location and the surrounding area, traffic issues and so on. Um, we also do, again, an in-depth um, environmental review and that can include and does include phase one and phase two which is phase one is background information phase two becomes um, soil borings and the like if it's necessary and I will say we do it almost every single at e every single site so that process uh, can take probably three months before we know that the site is suitable. How many months, you would say, average? Again, it, that, that will take three months or so just to see if the site is suitable. Okay. And then we do our own environmental assessment of the, of the building. Then we go through our, we don't, we don't, we're not subject to ULERP. However, we do have a public process that's required before we come and take it to the city council for approval. Uh, the uh, Jerome Avenue rezoning that just occurred, yes. uh, there were other rezonings that occurred prior uh, to the Jerome Avenue rezoning. What's your involvement in these rezonings? Yeah, um, actually we are at, sitting at the table with city planning and others when these rezonings are discussed and we, we are actually, for example, with, res, with Jerome Avenue, as a result of those discussions, we are planning two new schools, one in District 10 and one in District 9. Another example of a rezoning that resulted in a new school would be the East New York rezoning, where in fact we are planning a thousand seat school. So I'm sorry, uh, the Jerome Avenue rezoning, I know 
there's one school that so, was approved in Cabrera. When did the second one come up? We have in, in the course of the discussions, we recognize that there would be a seat need in both District 9 as well as District 10. So um, there is a school planned. We do not have a site as of yet, but it should, we, we feel very comfortable that we'll be able to so in reality, identify. you only have one school coming to that rezoning. No, we have two. One so in so district you have a site nine, for the second one? One in District 9 yes. and one in District 10. And you have sites for both? I have a site for District 10, and we are investigating several sites in District 9. Okay. Um, in terms of the, um, the rezoning that just occurred, uh, there was an EIS that is done. And there was a projection that 6,000 more seats will be needed over the course of 10 years in the Jerome Avenue rezoning. Um, that's approximately 12 new schools. Uh, now, if the SCA is thinking about long range or even medium range planning, why are they not able to deliver more school sites to address this need? I'm not familiar with these figures. Um I apologize, but I, I really, I would have to look at this a little bit. Okay, deeper. that's fine. Um, in the Jerome Avenue rezoning, there was a site, they were looking for schools, and there was a site that was identified by Council Member Cabrera. Yeah. And it came to light that this site was a DOE-owned property. Yes. And uh, I know that it had to do, there was a garden and a playground mm -hmm. where there were concerns with, um, but the council member needed to identify this site. Yeah. I'm sorry, I, okay. I apologize. The council member needed to identify this site. Um, does DOE have a list of all their DOE open spaces that are, are not being properly utilized where, you, where these spaces can potentially be good sites for schools? Yes, and this in this particular case, this was flagged. This is used uh, right now as play space, I believe. Um, and that is exactly the site that we are planning to move forward with. Um, fortunately, it is DOE uh, space. But yes, we have information um, on those pieces of property, which are very few, by the way that are not being used at this time. Does DOE share that information with you? Does SCA have a list of all these open spaces, sites that? Absolutely. Okay. So there's a list that exists. So I can request that list and that's uh, public information. I, sure. Yeah. Well, I would probably say that we'll have to compile it for you, but we certainly can. Yeah. All right. Um, so a broker did not find a site for Cabrera. So there was no broker's fee paid. That's right. Okay. All right, just wanted to be clear. Um, how long does it typically take to make an offer to purchase a site? Hmm. That's a good question. Well, first we wanna know that the site is appropriate for our kids and uh, engage in those discussions and negotiations. It, you know, a negotiation could certainly take from, you know, a month to in some cases, in one case specifically, took a year before we reached a, uh, a price that everybody was comfortable with. Uh, my, my other question on the broker, yes. um, when a broker, what is their role? They just identify a site. I know you give them guidelines as mm -hmm. to what space is needed, mm -hmm. what's suitable, Correct. there's formulas for what's suitable for a school. Mm -hmm. Once they identify their, that site, what is their role here? Okay, their role would be, first of all, notifying us appropriately and we would uh, send our architects and engineers to take a look to verify that it's the site we'd be interested in. Uh, if it is, then the broker is really in contact with the owner, okay, and in some cases as begins the negotiation, makes an offer to the owner, and certainly then our attorneys take over, but they will, begin until such time as we are in active negotiations with the, with the uh, owner, they will really be the point of contact. Is there uh, a certain dollar amount per square footage that you allow the broker to negotiate? I know land in certain boroughs are right. cheaper than other boroughs. Right. We do an appraisal of every property 
so that we are paying a fair market value. Okay. You know, in the, um, in the city of New York, we have a housing crisis. Uh, there's a lot of affordable housing or mixed use housing being built, right. especially in the Bronx. Um, there's a lot of development occurring in my district, for example. Mm -hmm. What conversations is city planning having with SCA to give you a heads up to say in terms of what's coming down the line in the next three years in terms of housing? Sure. Uh, to number one, create your, your formula, and number two, to start scoping out potential sites for schools. Sure. Uh, actually, in our process, as I, as I mentioned earlier, we do our projections yearly. So we work with um, our demographers. And in that process as well, we work very closely. We get information from city planning on those, those rezonings and those, uh, those applications that have come up formally and what they anticipate over time to come up. So we've, we've very well aligned with city planning on that information. We know what's in the pipeline, for example. All right. Um, as part of this uh, plan, uh, the, uh, the planning to learn um, report, um, you know, it, it spoke in detail in terms of affordable or a mixed use affordable housing. And uh, at least in my council district, I'm seeing a lot of development occurring, and the developers are partnering with charter schools. They're bringing in charter schools, uh, I guess because of space. Um, I, is there a uh, conversations, are there any conversations that SCA is having with developers to see if they can uh, accommodate the amount of space that you need in some of these uh, mixed-use developments? Absolutely. Now. This is based upon what our projections are for seat need in a particular district. So, for example, if you are currently in a district where, in fact, there is no identified seat need and we don't have information that tells us that there will be seat need in the future, we won't have that conversation. However, if we anticipate seat need and we see that kind of development, I, I think I mentioned in my testimony a number of uh, developers who we are currently working with on exactly that, uh, where in fact we can find space within a building. I know that the mayor has this plan in terms of building affordable housing, and their goal is to build 300,000 units uh, um, within an X amount of time. Uh, in talking to developers, do you see uh, that they, in order for them to give you more space, they would have to build less units? And therefore, right. is there a compromise? Is the administration, are they involved and they're saying we prefer more affordable units than building schools? Do you want to get that one? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think, uh, uh, good morning. Um, you can imagine it's a case-by-case -case basis as we look at sites that we do see, and as you know, many we don't ever get to see in city planning. We do think about what is, what could work on that site and whether there is an opportunity for any agency, particularly SCA, to, to use some of it. There are other instances where the site is better suited for affordable housing, so it really depends a bit on the dimensions of the site and the location of the site, in addition to whether that site can accommodate density nearby or whether they actually you know, can't really accommodate density as it is. Um, as Lorraine has mentioned, there's a lot of conditions as to what makes a good site. Uh, in some cases, the dimensions just aren't suitable for a gym or a laboratory, uh, given the footprint. So we do think about it on a case-by-case -case basis, but we're, you know, it's part of the ongoing dialogue is to share with them what we're learning when um, developers do come to us. Um, it's worth noting that often developers don't come to us at all, and it's, you know, it's as of right building, in which case we don't have, you know, that's where SCA really is spending a lot of their time focusing already um, outside of city planning. Uh, the frustration here, city planning, is that you're coming to us council members with projects in terms of building affordable housing. We understand that there's a need. I, I do understand it. Uh, but I have yet to see city planning come and say, we're going to add a school in your district. Or, hey, X amount of units. In, in my time that I've been in office, I've approved over 4,000 units of new 100% affordable housing. Now, one time, has city planning say, 
we need to have a discussion in terms of how many seats you need to accommodate these 4,000 units that are coming to your community. That has not happened, and that needs to happen. That needs to be part of your conversations. It's not just about building affordable housing, but what resources are we giving communities that are coming in, these new families that are coming into our communities? And that's what's lacking here. Um, when a, a site is available to, to uh, the SEA or to, to, the, uh, to, yeah, to the SEA, um, that does not meet your ideal size requirements for a new school, mm -hmm. but you feel that it's still worth pursuing for a new school, what kind of trade-offs uh, in terms of designs uh, do you consider, if any? Yeah, um, again, <laughs> our um, ideal site for an elementary school would be a footprint of 20,000 square feet, but we recognize that that's rare and few and far between. So we'll go down as low as 12,000 square feet. What you find now that you didn't find years and years ago when schools were being built is you will see what we call a gymatorium, which is a gymnasium that has a stage and movable seating that can be used in both ways. Those are the kinds of things that we had to do based upon what's available. Okay. Um, Want to talk a little bit about the city environmental quality review process. Okay. Um, how do you determine the number of new residential units that you expect will occur in the future, which is used during the environmental review process? Again, that is with our uh, partners in government and the information that we have from city planning and and yeah. Well, then why are there no housing units projected to be constructed between years five and ten in the housing projection numbers in the city environmental quality review? Uh, is there a specific area that you're looking at there? Or? I'm sorry? Uh, is there a specific area you're looking at overall? The uh, housing source data that, that's being used. I, again, it's, I, I don't know if you're referring to a specific rezoning application or there's a broader uh, comment you're making. The Seeker Tech Manual is quite specific as to what we need to incorporate as to how to build out those projections and how to think about the different impact, impacts on a lot of different agencies. And we take you know, guidance on the Seeker Tech Manual, which is managed by uh, the, managers, the, the Mayor's Office of Environmental Coordination, um, who also may be here to answer some questions on that. What I'll do is I'll give this question to the council. Maybe you guys can give us something in writing with a more detailed okay. answer because I just did not understand your, yeah. your answer to this question right now. Okay. Um, I, um, in terms of the, uh, the formula that is used uh, per borough, it's called a multiplier. Yeah. Uh, why is there only one multiplier or formula per each borough? And I'll give you an example. In Crown Heights and in Greenpoint, uh, they have very different numbers in terms of school age children. And how does the same multiplier apply to projects in those two places do a good job predicting the number of students generated? And Crown Heights has more than 20,000 children under the age of 18. And in Greenpoint, they have less than 8,000 children under the age of 18, yet the same multiplier or the same formula is used to identify the needs in those communities. Again, that is one piece of the, of the puzzle. That is not the entire puzzle. Okay, those multipliers, uh, I will say this, we're certainly open to working with uh, the task force or working group on the multipliers, but let me just say this. We are typically, the SCA's numbers and our projections are typically, one, um, we over project actually over one to two percent citywide. So we are very comfortable with the numbers that we're using because they are very, we've proven that we are very accurate. E even though that there's different needs in different communities in the same borough? Again, some, because that is one piece of the puzzle, we use other things. We use um, 
immigration numbers, we use uh, migration numbers, we use a number of different variables to come up with the formula to do our projections. Okay. Which uh, recommendations from this planning to learn report are you willing to adopt? The SEA is open to all of them. Um, again, there are some in there that would require um, other agencies to provide information and data, and they can speak to that. Uh, I can only say, and as I said early on, is we are always open to ways in which we can do things better. All right. Uh DOE, uh, wh are which, um, which recommendations are you willing to adopt as part of this plan? Well, one of the things that uh, we were very struck by in reading the plan was that many of the suggestions regarding non-capacity approaches are things that we actively engage in and will continue to engage in and would like to, are happy to continue discussing. But the opportunities to place programs uh, in underutilized buildings to draw families uh, from overutilized schools is something that we currently do and, and will continue to do. Um, and looking at needs and potentially how we can use rezonings, ECF, and, and other programs that we have that don't depend upon uh, SCA finding a, a perfect new site, um, we absolutely are pursuing those and, and are happy to continue discussing them. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'll be around for a second round of questions. Thank you. Uh, and just, uh, just to, since we have all the you know, so some of the relevant uh, agencies, authorities here, uh, just just qu very quickly, just go through the line here. So, Deputy Chancellor Rose, have have you had a chance to review this report? I have read the report cover to cover. Thank you, uh, President Grillo. Have you reviewed Absolutely. the report? Absolutely. City planning. Yes. DCAS. Yes. So we've heard from DOE and uh, SCA about an openness to adopt or accept some of these recommendations. Let's hear from DCAS and from city planning. So the, the part that, that pertains to DCAS as far as information sharing, um, I, I think the council is going to work with several of our colleagues to work on the language, but in principle we have no objection and we are happy to share that information uh, as often at, or as a formalized process as um, is determined as best to get that information back and forth. Okay, so just, just so we understand, uh, because there's a number of, of bills that we're also hearing today, does, so does DCAS support intro 461? The, the, the sharing of any lots that become available in our surplus over 20,000 square feet, yes. All right, so just DCAS is on the record. They and I, I, again, I think there was some issue with some of the language, but we, uh, in, in principle, we have no problem sharing that information as is best decided. Okay, and does uh, SCA and DOE support intro 729? Try to remind me which one. <laughs> That's the... Uh, Intro by Councilmember Kalos and Menchaca to um, requiring the DOE to post methodology and data for determining right. identified seat need. And again, we are always open to this kind of suggestion. However, I think what we need to do is work together with the council staff on exactly how to present information like that. I'm not, I'm not negative on this. I think what's important, though, is that our expectations are the same on, on this particular intro. Okay, uh, so th there's an openness for discussion Absolutely. on this legislation. Uh, and does DCP, and uh, I don't know if Buildings is here, uh, support intro 759? I'd say uh, we've spoken to Councilmember Gibson's staff about this bill that she introduced and have some concerns about the way it's been it's been put up, uh, not in concept for what it's trying to accomplish, but just in that uh, we feel that it's not going to accomplish what they've intended, and indeed, um, while we're supportive of looking at as many developments as possible, um, this one, actually, if you attack it this way, it will come up way too late in the process for what SCA needs. What, what concerns do you have? I'm just 
uh, again, this, this bill would suggest that we, for certain um, size app applications with certain sizes, we would flag that with, with SCA um, or require anyone of certain sizes to flag that. And what we, in thinking about the bill more deeply, what we find is that actually, it, by the time we get something at this Department of City Planning, that they've already developed the site, they've already got plans for what they want to do with it, and it's way too late for the SCA to get involved in most cases. Um, and it's going to create a lot of um, agitas on something that actually isn't going to result in that. We'd rather keep working with SCA as we have been um, and work with uh, the council member to try to find a different way to accomplish that goal. Um, again, SCA is quite involved with a lot of these sites where there is opportunity, and it, this particular channel isn't going to, I don't think, service anything usable for SCA. Okay. Uh, I guess there'll be some follow-up with Council Member Gibson uh, on the bill. Um, and just, you know, I've heard during the course so far today, and we're going to hear more from my colleagues now, is that there's been a lot of these informal discussions between agencies. We're looking for a formalized process of communication between these agencies. Because as I heard with regards to the Jerome Avenue rezoning, mm -hmm. um, sites were identified once the UR process was really taking shape. And it seems that the, the, the DOE or SCA might be aware of certain seat needs across, you know, across the city of New York, but they're not acted upon only until there's an active UR process taking shape. Um, and that's when phone calls seem to be being made between city planning, SCA, DCAS, and others, DOE, about we need to find sites here because there's a UR up here and we have to make this work. Mm -hmm. That's not responsible planning. Uh, that should be happening with or, re with or without a UR uh, happening. And so I think that we need a more formalized process of, of communication across all the relevant agencies and to also just expand the SEA's capacity to act upon the, uh, the identified need. Um, let's turn to my colleagues now. Oh, we've also been joined by Councilmember Barron, Councilmember Powers, Councilmember Carnegie, and Councilmember Ulrich. Uh, so just to remind my colleagues, the clock is at three minutes for round one questions. Uh, we'll begin with Councilmember Kalos. Thank you uh, to the many chairs uh, leading this committee with three minutes. I uh, will jump right into questions. Over the past three years, uh, th sorry, over the past four years, three months, and uh, 11 hours, 59 minutes, <laughs> I've been asking you the same questions at every single hearing. Is there a need for more seats in my district? How many seats are you building in my district? Uh, so, so let's start with that question. It, you usually say you see no identified seat need. Okay. Um, I see no identified seat need at this time. Uh, and, and yet you're building more seats in my district because we have seats. We, we're getting 900 pre-K seats. That's a very different question. Oh, I was specifically talking about the K to K to eight seats. Fair enough. And and so I guess w the concern I've had all along is that the identified seat need omits the pre-K need and, and the coming need. And uh, I guess the so I have this hypothesis that the methodology and underlying data is leading to inaccurate projections, which is why I introduced introduction 729. So, so just to be clear, not negative doesn't sound like support. Do you support opening up your methodology and the data so that all of us around can see what may be leading to any of the inaccuracy? And again, we support the concept of opening up the data. What we would need to do is work with staff to see what's possible and what specifically and what particular inter information in what order that you would like that information to to be uh, public I, I I'm hoping I, I don't believe that transparency should need legislation I, I am hoping we can get a lot of a lot not only what's in this bill but a whole lot more information disclosed to the public sure. as, as we look at this without having to just do a, another bill because I don't think that's the right way to do things or legislating too much when we can just get things done by agreement Okay. Uh, again, enough. we need so to have discussion. in terms of the accuracy, is it true that the SCA accuracy for the Blue Book enrollment projections is often off by 1% to 2% citywide? No, actually our projections for enrollment are typically 1% to 2% over. We over project 1% to 2% citywide. 
Is there any district where the projections are off by more than one to two percent? Is there any district where it is under? Uh, and if so, how much and which district? I don't have that information, but we'll get it for you. I guess it's just, okay. And so will you agree to not only share that information sure. with the city council, but share it publicly annually moving forward down to community school districts and sub-district? Again, we, we are, we are more than happy if we've under projected. Remember, we do the projections every year. We update them every year. So if we've made an error, which I'm sure has happened, we will do our very best to correct that error in next year's projections. So that information, all of that information is out there. So you have the projection for a particular district. You also have the blue book information, which is capacity and utilization. If there is that a huge difference, that will easily be picked up in those having that bit of information available. And, and, and it's already okay. available. And we could certainly go for round two once that time comes, Councilmember Kalos. Uh, next, we'll have Councilmember Gibson. Thank you so much. Thank you, President Grillo. Thank you, Deputy Chancellor and DCP and DCAS. Um, certainly, before I ever criticize, I always compliment. Um, I've had an incredible working relationship with SCA, and I appreciate all of the work you have really put together. I want to thank our chairs and certainly the City Council in 2017 for formulating this working group to even come up with a series of recommendations. Um, I'm grateful that there is an acknowledgement that we can always improve and we can always operate more more efficiently and effectively. Um, and I will say, just in terms of working on the Jerome neighborhood rezoning plan, the brokerage firm that's assigned to the Bronx did nothing to help in Jerome. The organizations and, and the groups that SCA is now working with to identify a site to build my school in School District 9, I recommended all of those landowners to SCA. So, you know, again, and this is why we're having these conversations because we have enough stakeholders in this toolbox where we can really come up with ideas and ways in which we can cite schools. And so I'm grateful that there is a level of understanding of why we've put forth this comprehensive package of legislation. Uh, my particular bill, 757, which does create a task force. Um, I believe that we should have better interagency coordination, not just DOE and SCA, but HPD and DCP and, and DCAS, because for all of the thousands of housing units that we're building, whether it's a zoning or not, we have to be prepared. And so, you know, that's re the reason why the, the bill was proposed in the first place, because I do think there is no interconnectivity um, to make sure that for every several thousand units of housing we're building, we're also building the schools as well. And so I would love to continue to talk to you about that um, and making sure that HPD um, and DOB are at the table, um, because while I was able to get a zoning, there's no guarantee that School District 9 would see a brand new school outside of having a zoning and now we may have had the numbers but obviously the zoning propelled that even more um, I just had one question it was following what one of our chairs has said just in terms of the housing multiplier mm -hmm. and the fact that there almost seems to be a citywide multiplier and not something that's a little bit more borough based and even within a particular borough like the Bronx um, that does have a lot of city-owned land that remains at our disposal, are there any changes that SCA is looking to do to that multiplier to really keep up with current times and current challenges that we're facing? So my school district nine, we have the highest concentration of students in temporary housing. Yeah. And a lot of those families that are living in shelters um, came from our community and come from the community. And so there's an urgency to keep them in the community. So I'd just like to understand in terms of future conversations, if there will be any changes to focus on unique aspects of borough and neighborhoods. Actually, thank you, council member. Um, Actually, we are considering uh, a change to the multiplier at this particular point, but I think you've raised a broader question, which has to do with particularly homeless children and their specific needs. And I think that we, this deserves, as you said, a task force or 
at least a further discussion with the working group to see how we can uh, attempt to address that. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, chairs. I look forward to working with you on certainly a better tracking system so we can all have one conversation as we look to uh, not just create new schools, but also um, the challenges of an ever demanding and growing population in New York City. So I thank you, Chair Traeger. Thank you, Chair Jum. And thank you to Chair Salamanca. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember. Next, we'll, uh, we'll hear from Councilmember Grudenchik. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Ms. Grillo. Thank you, Deputy Chancellor Rose, for being here today. Always a pleasure to see you. And thank you for your excellent work in Eastern Queens. Um, my question is about joint operated playgrounds. And I know we're going to be building on one at PS46 Queens. Are they always available to you? Is, and how does that work? And I may be here having a hearing as Parks Chair later this year about them, <laughs> but that's not to be discussed today. But the question is, are they always available? No, in answer, thank you, Council Member. Um, they're not always available, and I think that you will probably hear this from Parks as well. I mean, there are certain areas of the city where we have jointly operated playgrounds and very, very little open space anywhere else. So in those cases, we will certainly, in every single case that we are attempting to, to take some space in a jointly operated playground for an addition or that sort of thing, we certainly sit down with parks and we look at this in a case-by-case -case basis. And I'm looking at a site, another site, which I'll talk to you offline. I have three sites for you, actually. <laughs> um, but is it possible always or almost always to build, if we were to take a, a playground that was school property, mm -hmm. is it easy to put a playground on top of the school so that you know, we would just have a, a, a playground in the sky, so to speak? No, it's, it, it's easy. I would not describe it as being easy. It's difficult because there are a couple of things. You don't certainly, it's going to have a noise impact to those people if you're living near a high rise, for example. Um, I don't have any of those, so keep okay. going. <laughs> All right, so that's not a problem. Um, it's, it's, it's also expensive, um, but by the same token, uh, we've done it in a lot of cases because there are laws about how much open space is required for, um, for schoolyards. And so we do it where, in fact, we're taking enough open space that leaves the children very little. So we'll, we'll do it then. Okay. All right. Um, I'll give you my card with the spots. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Thank you, Councilmember. Uh, next, we'll hear from Councilmember King. Thank you, um, Chair, Chair, and Chair. Um, <laughs> um, but it's always a delight to have the School Construction Authority in front of us to answer questions of how do we create houses for our children. Um, I have five questions, not too difficult, but if you hear something that I'm piggybacking off something I heard Traeger say earlier as well. Um, but I'd just like to know, do you have a list of throughout the city of New York, one, of your overcrowding neighborhoods and districts. Reason I ask that one question is because some, that type of district might have, should be a priority other than someone who just wants a new school, Correct. just because. Correct. Second question is, how effective have been the relationships with the realtors in the four boroughs that you've been working with because they are on a payment plan or scheduled to deliver, and if they're not delivering, what is the plan to continue the relationship or not continue the relationship? Right. Third, um, how much do you work with your local city council members to identify sites? I know you've worked with, in, in due to your testimony, about two or three between uh, Council Woods and I forget the other one, that you've worked with for sure. sites and, in, and being engaged with. How often do you reach out and, and get involved with them? Um, fourth, um, how do you handle utilizing space when you're trying to create seats? I know in the past I've visited some schools that they've taken storage closets and made schools made seats in them. I've been in schools, but that's the reality. Um, how have you managed if you had a request to say we want to convert this space into classroom space that might be unbecoming of learning? Because I know if I'm a student and all of a sudden I get placed in a place that I know that never was a classroom, it might be mm -hmm. not a, not a motivating factor for me to learn. So how do you deal with those kind of requests and? What external factors, my last question. Six, that's six. Oh, really? <laughs> I must have had an A and B in there somewhere, my bad. Um, 
what external factors would you say get in the way of you building or designing a school? Okay. All right. I think I remember everything. I'm not quite sure, but I will say this. First of all, the list of neighborhoods and, and all of that information is in our capital plan. It's online. It tells you we break it down in specific uh, areas within sub districts within school districts. So that is all there, and that's what we focus on. We focus on the areas of need, certainly. Um, I think you asked about our brokers, and again, we have them under contract. We go out with an RFP every three years, I believe, and I'm, I may be wrong, but it may be two. But if they're not performing, obviously, that's going to be part of their evaluation, and they probably won't get another contract. Um, let me think now. I, I Forgive me. You just wrote. That's okay. Number three was how often do you work with oh, city council oh, absolutely. identifying I, sites? I will, I will say to you that uh, council member Kalos was very helpful in finding UPK locations. Council member Drum uh, found us a site before it went on the market for um, a new school in his district. As council member Gibson mentioned earlier, she identified several sites as part of the Jerome rezoning. Council member Traeger gave us some sites for um, additions to schools. And I'm sure that um, in those areas of need, we've had, it, we, we've had a terrific relationship with the city council and the members, and they have been very, very helpful. But none of us got the commission. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I, so I thank you. I, I was just trying to get to see how proactive that <laughs> SE is as, as opposed to waiting for us to yeah. say, hey, listen, we got a crisis or there's a new development. Uh, this is SCA, yeah. let them know this is a site we have. How proactive SE say reaching out to the council offices, listen, right. do you have potential spaces? Is you, you know, right. you're overcrowded. We see that you're overcrowded. Can you help us identify or as opposed to waiting until a, a deal starts getting negotiated, then we come into the process. I guess that was the question I was trying okay. to figure out. And I, and I believe that we've had um, meetings with each individual council member uh, dealing with whatever the concerns are, and particularly if there's overcrowding. And those are things that we very often say to the councilman. Nobody knows better than the local elected official as well as the local community of where sites could be, could mm -hmm. be available or what's the most... Um, uh, what's the best location for an addition, for right. example, things like that. So, yes, we have a great relationship with you. Okay. And, and I can address the question about what if a school is interested in converting space within their building. Uh, our uh, office of space, our space management group uh, is responsible for working with schools on that, and sometimes it can be the school identifies or has a question about can we reconfigure a space, uh, and sometimes we will look at an overcrowded building and, and send someone in to sort of assess, is there anything we can do to help the school out um, by, you know, are there rooms with windows that um, could be uh, administrative space or could be, uh, we've converted a lot of unused locker rooms to exercise spaces or dance spaces in ways that help schools. Okay, and then my final question. Oh, okay. Council Member, we can do round two, that, that, that would be great, we can add you to the list because Councilmember Adams has been waiting very patiently. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Sure. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chair uh, Traeger, Chair Drum, Chair Salamanca. Thank you so much, uh, Deputy Chancellor, President Grillo, members of uh, DCAS and City Planning for being here with us today. I actually have one question and then I have a, a general comment. Regarding working with council members to discover and uncover new sites, uh, my colleague, uh, Councilmember Miller, mentioned that there were talks with him and my predecessor regarding a site on 115th, specifically to Southeast Queens, which I'm just going to deal with. Uh, 115th Avenue and Guyar Brewer Boulevard, that was a site that's intended for something else, I believe a hotel, uh, which uh, apparently there were some talks about possibly being a new school building. Does that ring a bell at all? I'm not familiar with that particular site, but I can certainly get back to you. I, I really don't recall that. Okay, thank you. Um, the last thing that I'm going to say, it's going to be a general comment, um, and it's not a pleasant comment, unfortunately. I, I kind of have to uh, unroll the spool a little bit because we're speaking about 
um, placement of children uh, and building out. And quite the opposite we've seen in Southeast Queens where the Blue Book has continually been used against us and against communities of color uh, in Southeast Queens and across the city of New York. And case in point, we are now looking at the seventh education administration coming into August Martin High School. This proposal is going to be brought forth on April 25th. August Martin High School is one of 78 renewal schools right now. It is also a community school, also adopted by Community Board 12, which happens to be my community board that I've chaired uh, over many, many years. August Martin High School is co-located right now with New Visions Charter High School, which is still phasing in up to 12th grade. It is also co-located with Voyages, which is a South Transfer High School. It is also co-located with an alternate, alternate learning center, which is a suspension, with a suspension list. It is also co-located with a District 79 program, Pathways to Graduation, ages 17 through 21. It is also co-located with a Restart Academy. Now, my question is, when does the DOE say enough and allow the growth of a renewal school to happen? When does the DOE say enough? To me, it seems preposterous and an irresponsible decision to continue to co-locate schools, specifically in communities of color for the most part. Now we've looked at tremendous progress in Councilmember Grudenchik's uh, district with uh, Martin Van Buren High School, something that we are all very, very proud of. My question is why is this disservice continuing to happen, not just to the District 75 students who will be brought in, but also to all of these students in six different education administrations in August Martin High School. So council member, I'm afraid we're going to have to disagree on this. Um, providing an opportunity for students with disabilities to attend high school with their non-disabled peers is incredibly important and valuable to those students. And the notion that we would not use space that we have available in order to serve students who have particular needs um, in a building that we think is working well, where we have confidence in the education administration that they can well serve these students would be a, its own disservice. I would, I would respectfully disagree with you. In every school that I've gone into, spoken with different uh, administrators and principals, they make it work because they have to make it work, not because it is a pleasant, agreeable situation or even the best situation. Uh, in my humble opinion, it, we are doing a disservice to our students uh, who do a, attend District 75 schools by, by bringing them into an environment like this. I think we can do much, much better, better as a city. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember. Next, we'll hear from Councilmember Powers. Thank you. Thank you for being here. And I um, apologize for missing your testimony, but I, I did get notes on it. Um, I, I, wa I wanted to thank, to thank uh, uh, the DOE and the SCA and presumably others uh, to piggyback on Councilmember Kalos and I think you mentioned earlier for responding to universal pre-K needs on the Upper East Side. I, I, I assume we will still need more in the future, but I think that um, the constituents in both of our districts are, are very pleased with the fact that a uh, program that has been touted so much is, a, is, is accessible and available. So I want to thank you for that. My question is, I, I think part of, the, part of the issue in the East Side of Manhattan and its other dense districts is space an affordable space mm -hmm. and the second one is growth it's the fact that we have buildings going up and we have we see them every day large-scale buildings some are occupied some are more vacant but my question is more global for the moment which is that how when as the building this maybe is for city planning as all these buildings are filing for permits and and going on the line you presumably don't know how big or large those buildings are how many are going to be for families and things like that. At what point do we capture that in this process? Do we actually capture, you're doing a year by year projection of need, but these uh, buildings are going up and you're doing some analysis, but I, I assume only at the end of when the buildings start, or when the buildings start to be occupied. So how do, when do we cap, start capturing the need as all these sort of mega towers in our districts are going up? Sure. Thank you, council member. Um, yeah, in fact, uh, we capture that information every year when the 
uh, when they are issued permits. The builder is issued a permit, that information comes to us every year. So it's not a surprise. We don't have to wait until the building is, is you know, constructed and finished. What we'd like to, we'd like to have that information because that informs what the seat need will or will not be in your particular district. And, and do you have specific data then, or uh, you have to make an estimation on everything, but then do you, when you get a permit, does it actually give you information about, or will, can you make an estimation then, an appropriate one about how many families, I mean, one bed, studios yeah. are likely to net something yeah. different than three bedrooms or? Right. Yeah, the basic, um, a lot of the information that they draw on is from the Department of Buildings permits, which has a number of units, net new units that are going to be on that site. In some cases, they're demolishing a site and adding units. In other cases, they're demolishing a site and reducing the net units. And that's something that is part of the input that we give you know, on an annual basis, um, which they can then uh, they use uh, to integrate with some other inputs for the overall student projection. Got it. Thank you. And I don't, I don't pretend that the, at this point my district is as oversaturated as some of the other ones of my colleagues, but I think we do still have issues where we're looking at, uh, I know one of the schools right in my district is good, there's a lot of complaints about uh, oh, oh, you know, overcrowding already. And so as we're going, as we're adding, as new, sp new buildings are being added online and there's a lot of them going up, is there, a pr I mean, you have brokers who are doing it. Yeah. What is the proactive approach? Not just uh, we bring one to you or we're able to negotiate one in a EULER, but what is the proactive approach for getting okay. for a negotiating space? And then also, I guess my question is, what is the receptiveness uh -huh. to adding school space into versus commercial space or other, yeah. other uses? Okay. So, um, again, we're going into those areas that we have identified seat need. And our brokers are searching, okay? Now, what is the advantage? And this is something we do and I've done personally is uh, speak to the real estate board and speak to other groups uh, about the advantage, see, speak to developers in groups and so on about the advantages of putting a school within their building and how it often sells their apartments because it's such a great convenience for people. But I can't force a developer who's building as of right. What's the advantage? The advantage for them is they will get their rent on time. And there is, you know, we sign a long-term lease, we pay for a long-term lease. So those are some of the things that we try to use. But again, if a, if a builder is doing it as of right, there's nothing I can do to force that person to to. Uh, yeah, I, it wasn't it wasn't a wasn't a request that you yeah. you can or you or yeah. uh, anything. I was more about the receptiveness to that versus right. another use, and some of that will also pay the rent on time. I'm sure chains and um, things like that. Interestingly enough, in, in I know I know your area well. Uh, there is a, a tremendous amount of empty storefronts there is. along First Avenue. It leads into my next question, uh -huh. uh, which is actually which just, what is the minimum baseline for school space? So, so, so I have to imagine that under fair, like under for, for funding, you have to get a certain amount of students into a building to make it even, it's even fine. affordable to open the doors, turn the lights on. W I'm what gonna, is that breaking? I'm going to say that we would not want to go lower than a, a total of 95,000 square feet for, for uh, our students to build a small elementary school. All right. And, and I'll we, we could save for round two. Okay. Uh, that, right. Thank you very much. Um, I just, just want to kind of respond to earlier comments uh, with regards to um, when the DOE will send staff to visit a, an overcrowded school and say, let's reimagine or repurpose some existing space to, to address that. Because I've experienced that uh, in, in a school where uh, classrooms that were once used to provide CTE opportunities had to be taken away to address overcrowding. Uh, certain spaces where teachers can collaborate and plan together and debrief you know, after they would observe each other's classes were taken away to accommodate the growth in student enrollment. And so there are consequences, instructional consequences, when space is repurposed inside of a school building to accommodate the overcrowded, uh, you know, the, the high n number of, of enrollment. And that does have an, a negative impact on education. That does have a negative impact 
on uh, the quality instruction. That does have a negative impact, in my view, with regards to opportunities for, for, for kids. And this is something that you know I, I think we need to have prioritized across the board. Uh, because, again, Deputy Chancellor, I, I agree that there are extraordinary students and extraordinary educators that despite all these challenges, they still have an ability to, to overcome uh, some of these uh, obstacles. But there are a number of kids that still need that individualized attention. There are still a number of our students who still have talents and abilities that will only be kind of exposed in, in, in a variety of settings that sometimes are removed to accommodate overcrowded uh, schools. And also, respectfully, you know, educators are not robots. They, they, they can't just, you can't lesson plan in, in, in a closet in a school or sit in a noisy cafeteria and try to, you know, uh, grade papers or to try to plan, plan ahead. So they need space too. I mean, this is, this is an issue that impacts virtually every stakeholder. And then I hear from PTAs and parent groups that when they want to get involved in their school, it's hard to find space for them as well. So I, I, just, I just want that to kind of sink in across all agencies here that this has a profound impact in classrooms, in, uh, for, for educators to, to evaluate and to edit their instruction. Uh, it has an impact on CTE growth and expansion because we're only seeing CTE growth and expansion in certain areas and certain schools and not seeing it in other areas. And so uh, I don't know if you want to respond to that and then I have some more follow-up questions if you chance. Well, I think many of those topics that you just raised are addressed in and in part of the blue book formulas that help us determine when we need to build new capacity. So there is expected to be a certain amount of administrative space in every school, and if there isn't, the blue book actually deducts from the capacity of that building to reflect that it doesn't have all of the administrative space it needs, or if it doesn't have um, the number of cluster rooms that the school should have, the, you know, they add up the capacity of each classroom, the formula will deduct capacity if they don't have enough um, cluster rooms. So those, that information is part of, we've determined that this school is overcrowded, this neighborhood is overcrowded, and we need to build new capacity. It's not clearly for every individual school a one-to-one, -one, um, but it does help create the picture for a neighborhood and it helps us determine that we need to build more seats. Right, which, which leads me to my next question. Um, how does DOE determine whether or not to cap enrollment in a particular grade in a school or overall enrollment in a school? So um, we try to accommodate all zone students in their school wherever we possibly can. Um, if there are no opportunities to open additional class sections for uh, students in a particular grade and every class in that grade is at its contractual maximum, that is when we will cap uh, enrollment in a, in a grade and identify an alternative location for those students. But to be clear, are there schools that are experiencing significant overcrowding that still do not have capped enrollment and the DOE Family Welcome Center still will send students to that school knowing that it is significantly overcrowded, is that correct? So by definition, we will not cap a school until it is significantly overcrowded such that we don't have the ability to accommodate a student. How do you define significant overcrowding? So the school would, not, would have to not be able to open an additional class section and all class sections would be at their contractual limits for, of enrollment. So how do you ascertain that? Is there a number? So for kindergarten, the contractual class size limit is 25 students um, and the number of class sections uh, potential is based on the number of classrooms that a school has available. And so let's say a high school is exceeding 130, 140% capacity. What happens then? So it depends. Most of our high schools are not zoned. Um, so capping only applies to zoned students attending their zoned school. Um, 
if you have a zoned high school and there are 30 students in every class, um, there still is the ability to enroll additional students in those class sections. Uh, if you have a zoned high school and you are at 32 students in every class, then we do not have the ability to add additional students and a zoned student might have to be accommodated at a different location. Can the DOE provide a full list of schools with capped enrollments, what their enrollment cap is and where students are shifted to keep enrollment under the cap? So capping actually occurs throughout the year. Um, because students do come and enroll throughout the year. So uh, capping may be very different at the very beginning of the year um, than in the middle of the year and, and so forth. So it, uh, that's a more complicated. It, there's not a single one point in time. But I think any information here would, would be helpful to understand how decisions are made, why decisions are made. Um, and you know, we hear from educators, from school leaders, that their schools are significantly, significantly overcrowded. And again, I'd like to, you know, see, you know, I, I understand that you're using the classroom size, but there are educators teaching classes that are over the contractual limit. I know that for a fact. Mm -hmm. As a former UFT delegate, I, I'm advocating for those educators to, to deal with this issue. So um, there are schools that are still significantly overcrowded, that are still, exper that are still receiving additional students. And the, and the leaders and the educators there say, look, we welcome all kids, but give us the space, give us the resources, don't take away our CTE rooms, don't take away our teacher departments, don't take away spaces where educators can collaborate. Um, how does the DOE determine where to create special programs such as gifted and talented community schools, dual language programs, progressive education models, and career and technical education programs? So for most of these, we work very closely with the superintendents of the local districts. We have uh, a planning process that we work with them annually uh, to identify what they feel the needs of their district would be, uh, and then work with them to identify where appropriate locations are. So gifted and talented is something uh, that many people are interested in. Um, the assessment may be include how many students are taking uh, the qualification tests for gifted and talented programs, how many are uh, reaching the levels. We are opening new gifted and talented programs in many districts starting at the third grade and using multiple measures in order to identify students for those seats. Um, dual language is largely based on the populations, local populations of students speaking. Um, a, another language uh, who are native speakers because you need both local native speakers and students who are English speakers who wish to learn the, the other language. Um, so it's all done very much in conjunction with the local superintendents. And is the, the, the utilization of a school taken into account in determining where to locate these special programs? Absolutely. Um, particularly if we are uh, talking about a programs that might be going into a zoned school, obviously a zoned school that is already overcrowded uh, would not be a location that we would look at to, op to open a program that is specifically designed to bring in students from outside the zone. It might be, however, uh, a perfect location for a program that specifically serves the zoned students. So uh, if the local school zone has a significant population of students speaking another language, a dual language program might be perfectly appropriate there. Is reducing overcrowding ever an explicit goal of creating a specialized program? Uh, it is. However, it's not necessarily easy to determine where students will come from. So we have uh, explicitly placed uh, dual language programs, gifted and talented programs um, in underutilized buildings with the hopes that families from local overutilized buildings might be interested in those programs. But we can't predict exactly who will take advantage of those programs. The reason why I'm asking this is that if, you mentioned before the roles of superintendents in the schools. Based on feedback that I have received and based on just my overall experience as well, um, if a school leader or if, school, if a school community informs a superintendent that enrollment is an issue. For example, these are schools that, let's say, uh, are having difficulty with enrollment. They'd like mm -hmm. to increase their enrollment, which actually has an impact on overcrowding in other schools. Mm -hmm. Because when, when parents receive letters, 
that their child has been assigned to a certain school and there's a perception issue or perception problem in that school, which might not be warranted, mm -hmm. um, then they want to go to a different school, they appeal, and they want to go to a school that probably is overcrowded already and because they've heard good things about it. So my question is, when a superintendent hears this, what is, what is the mechanism, what is the process to, 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 to go back to DOE, to, to superiors there, and to say, how can we help support this school with instituting programs that will better attract the school community to help support this perception problem? Mm -hmm. Because many times the education the ed educators and the leaders are left to their own devices to, to deal with this issue. And that to me is just not fair, Deputy Chancellor. Um, there are many schools that have taken um, a whole lot of negative media coverage f uh, over the course of, of the last decade, uh, particularly under the last administration, there was an agenda to hurt the public school system. And that is still has a rolling impact to today where that perception still exists. And I believe that we need to do better to support these schools because as we support these schools, you're actually helping solve the issue of overcrowding in schools that are experiencing significant overcrowding. So what can we do to help better support these schools with more specialized programs, with capital support to build additional space to attract the local school community? So we have been and, and will, are continuing to do that. Um, certainly with the rollout of universal pre-K, okay. uh, that has been, I think, a very strong support for many schools uh, that were, had difficulty attracting enrollment. Those were buildings where we might have had additional classrooms for more UPK classrooms uh, than the zone itself particularly yeah. needed. And so that's one thing that brought families into the school where they had a positive experience and then they also received priority should they wish for their children to continue in kindergarten in the same school where they were in UPK. Um, we do, we work with schools, uh, honestly, to encourage uh, opening them up to the communities because what it really takes to change reputation is to bring families in and see the programs that the schools are offering and see their celebration events or their school chorus or the school musical. Um, and, and so we are, we work with superintendents and principals and to help them think through how do they bring the community in to see the things that they're doing. Right. And superintendents will also tell you that they have a lot of schools in their portfolio and it's very hard to provide individualized attention to the individual school. So, so the chain of issues go, go up, goes up. Yeah. Is the DOE open to the council's recommendation to create specific plans to alleviate overcrowding in high need uh, districts? So again, we work annually with our superintendents on identifying what can we do. Uh, to help address these issues. Uh, do we have a plan for every single individual school? No, we do not, but we do look at neighborhoods and help develop plans for neighborhoods. Um, you know, a recent example uh, in um, Brooklyn, we had a series of overcrowded elementary schools along uh, a border of District 22. Um, we identified that we had middle school space nearby. We relocated a middle school out of an elementary school building. It actually was a building that we had opened, gifted, and talented in a couple years prior to help bring families into that school. And in doing so, we were then able to rezone four adjacent elementary schools to address overcrowding across a string of elementary schools that were all overcrowded. So we, we try to do things like that every year. Um, obviously, it doesn't happen in every single district every year, but we, we do look at those neighborhood re overcrowding to see what kinds of shifts we can make that will help. And does DOE consider equity or integration issues in deciding where to locate special programs? Um, so we certainly try to. Um, and in fact, I'd say um, many of the programs themselves um, can be helpful uh, in integration. Um, there are, you know, within the school, we also are concerned to ensure that we don't create, you know, pockets of students uh, who may look different from each other, because that's not um, the environment that we would like to see. 
Right. I, you know, I, I've stated before, and I do believe that in order for us to uh, better integrate our public school system, because in many in many different ways, segregation does exist, not just along racial lines, but in terms, you know, th th there could be one school with a significant number of kids with IEPs, and next school is very few, um, or, or English language learners, and, and so forth. But I, I do believe that we're going to need a multi agency, multi layered, prong approach to better integrate uh, our, our school communities and to offer better equity. And when we rezone schools, we do explicitly look at. Uh, questions of diversity okay. in the rezoning plans. Danny or? Um, I, I have one more, and then I, my colleagues just have uh, I know, round two questions. I've been very patient. I, I, I think it's very important that we also touch on the issue of accessibility. The Council's Planning to Learn report recommends that the DOE address the shortage of barrier free programs so that all students have equitable access to schools. In 2015, the U.S. Department of Justice found that 83% of the city's elementary schools were not fully accessible to people with disabilities, and currently there remain, uh, there remain districts in which there are no fully accessible schools. However, the current capital plan amendment includes just $100 million for accessibility projects and $27.6 million to ensure more schools can serve as accessible uh, shelter sites. Uh, why hasn't the city proposed additional funding to make more schools accessible? So that is something that we are looking at in the next capital plan. Uh, we're very um, pleased with the work that uh, our accessibility team has been doing uh, on a number of fronts. Uh, one is looking at each district um, and the level, the, the percentage of schools that are accessible at the elementary school level, at the middle school level, and at the high school level, and particularly starting with the elementary school level, identifying our accessibility projects to create equity across districts, so that we looked at the districts with the lowest percentage of accessible schools, and taking into account new schools that might be under construction by the SCA, we would then locate, ident um, identify and locate accessibility projects to bring up the lowest district to the level of the other districts and we are doing that step by step so that we are addressing accessibility in a very equitable way across districts. So you mentioned that this is being looked at and the council's response to, uh, to, to the prelim budget uh, recommend investing an additional 125 million dollars to make more schools accessible. Do you agree with this recommendation? Um, I, I certainly uh, think that we have enough projects out there that we could use that funding and we will in over the coming months as we develop the next capital plan uh, be looking at all of the different needs that we have uh, to determine a final budget. Well, you know, we have the resources Deputy Chancellor now we just have the we need to have the the the, uh, the will and just need to get, get this done. This, this, is, this is basic fairness, equity, and this is this, it's justice for our kids. I want to be very mindful of my colleagues and their time. Uh, round two questions. Uh, we'll begin with Councilmember Kalos. Thank you. There are 17 public schools in my district with 7,173 students as of 2015. A little more than half of our children in the neighborhood uh, are, are for a little more than half are children from the neighborhood, one third are citywide, the rest are screened district wide. For SCA, when identifying seat need, do you count all the seats physically in a neighborhood as meeting the neighborhood's need? For DOE, how do you determine whether a seat should go to provide a 3K, pre-K, or grade school in a child's neighborhood or a citywide or district wide seat? And for both, do you think that DOE and SCA should actually work together on how to use existing seats? And if DOE uses seats for citywide needs that SCA built to satisfy a local need, that SCA should have to replace those seats. Interesting. Uh, <laughs> okay, that's, that's an interesting approach, council member. Um, look, w our job, you know, again, we are not gonna determine who goes to a particular school or how they use city water zoned or whatever. We base our projections on plans for the future and current, over, current utilization. 
um, but I cannot, and that is for district-wide and sub-district. Um, I'm not, a, I'm a builder, that's what we do. We're planners and builders. What, how that school is used really goes to the Department of Education. And I believe that a tremendous amount of the programs that you talk about, tests in schools and that sort of thing, have been long standing in your particular district. It's not, it's, this is not something that this particular DOE has created over time. So, um, particularly at the elementary school level, most of our programs are zoned, not 100%. Um, and we do think it's important in all districts and in all neighborhoods to have choices. So yes, even in an area where there might be enough zoned students to fill all of the seats, we think it is important to have some programs that children can opt into, whether from local neighborhood seats or from further away. Um, at the high school level, we plan high schools on a borough basis, and again, we believe very strongly that there should be opportunities for students to attend schools uh, in a wide variety of geographies and not be limited to their own home neighborhood. So um, the use of schools in locations, um, it is important to have some programs that serve a broader geography. It is what helps create uh, opportunities for diversity for our students. It is what helps create opportunities for choice for our students. Um, but in your particular district, the vast majority of those seats are for zoned students. But with okay. regards to the rest, Last question, to, if I can just drive a point home. So we know that we have seats that aren't for the neighborhood, and, and that's great. I wish those seats would be more integrated instead of just segregated seats in a, in a community where they're not being integrated. But you know that the seats aren't there. You're counting it as seats for the community. So I'm just asking, with both of you here at the same table, why can't you just agree that, yes, those seats aren't serving the community and that there is additional need and that when DOE is programmatically not using it for the community that we actually need to build the more seats and let's integrate them, please. So I want to take exception to saying that those seats are not for the community. Those seats are absolutely open and available to the community. As well as seats that are not in the community are also open to, to those families from this local community. Okay, so uh, next we'll hear from uh, Council Member Gibson. Thank you so much again. I just had two very quick questions. Um, and I think Deputy Chancellor, you talked a little bit about particular schools like gifted and talented, dual language. Um, with some of the closures of the renewal schools that we've faced this year, um, there has been a new proposal and a new effort to focus on modeling schools off of L's. Um, and so my district has a high concentration of students with IEPs and students who are identified as L's. Um, and we need to make sure that we are building schools around that growing need. Um, I think we've recognized the need that exists today, but I also think we need to recognize that the need will only continue to grow. Um, and also, a lot of the families that I represent are large families where multiple children, siblings, happen to go to the same school, which is a great thing, but it also means that it's contributing to the overcrowding issue that we have. So I wanted to find out in terms of future conversations and how we are modeling off of very designated schools to focus on neighborhood needs like L, like gifted and talented, what does that conversation look like? And then my second question is, as ambitious as we need to be in building brand new schools, I also want to make sure that there is a priority in investing in the capital work in existing schools. We are asked to fund the upgrades to cafeterias, playgrounds, libraries, science labs, auditoriums every single year. And I will continue to do that, but I also want to make sure and understand what the process is that SCA has to identify the schools that are the greatest in need. So m most of my elementary schools today have between 800 and a thousand students in one school building that's a lot of kids I don't want to fight with you guys to renovate bathrooms but these are the types of things that have happened over the years mm -hmm. so if you could just expand and help me understand what the process is for the new schools because I am getting an L school in district 9 as well as the capital renovations of existing schools 
So, right on time. Thank you, Chair. <laughs> so in terms of the process for programs that are uh, focused on supporting a specific population or specific needs. Um, I have colleagues, uh, we all sit together in, at Tweed, who are deputy chancellors over those specific content areas. And I'd be uh, delighted to connect you with Deputy Chancellor Baez to discuss English language learners or Deputy Chancellor Rello and Selmy to discuss uh, students with disabilities. Um, not my wheelhouse. I'd, I'd like for you to have those conversations with the experts. Um, in terms of how do we identify uh, the greatest needs for upgrades um, within existing schools, um, for bathrooms we actually have um, a facilities rating process that helps us identify where our uh, facilities are substandard. We also work with our deputy directors of facilities uh, and local council members for your recommendations of schools where you feel there is the greatest need and we look at, at those. But we try to prioritize based on um, the assessments, the physical assessments of, of those bathroom conditions. Um, as, and you know, uh, Chair Traeger um, was advocating for funding for uh, accessibility, which we completely agree with. Um, we also have tremendous opportunities for upgrades to our existing schools and the how do we budget and, and decide the allocations for those different needs uh, is going to be part yeah. of our ongoing conversation for the next capital plan. Thank you very much uh, to my colleagues. And just, uh, again, just some very quick kind of takeaways fr from this hearing. I think that there's clearly a need for a formalized process to communicate and coordinate across the board from a variety of city agencies. Um, we've heard today a lot about informal conversations during certain you know, times of year when there, there might be a, a UERP or a zoning in, in the works. Um, and but I think that we could all benefit, the kids can benefit from a more formalized structure, and I appreciate your openness from, from everyone here uh, to have that. Um, another takeaway, I think, from today for us as well is the, uh, the capacity of the existing brokers and you know, making sure that we expand capacity on that front. Um, I could tell you one agency that does a pretty good job of finding space and acting on that space pretty quickly, that's EDC. When they want to build something, when they want to expand that, uh, the mayor's housing plans, they, get to, they, they find it. Uh, and, and we hear about it in our communities. So maybe there, there's, there's an opportunity to have a conversation with EDC and, and, their, and their folks to, see, to share best practices, uh, using some, some, some teaching terms. Um, and also, I would, I would uh, you know, ask the DOE to continue to find ways to support underutilized schools as well. Um, I believe that obviously this is, there, we discussed some bigger issues today, but this is also, a, I think, an issue that too many of our school communities face. They need support in a, in a variety of ways. We still need to fight back this perception problem <clears throat> that I think exacerbates overcrowding in certain schools and certain school districts as well, and there's a lot more work to do. Uh, and, and I thank you all for, for your for your time today and, uh, and for your partnership. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Okay, our next panel, uh, Leonie Hameson, uh, Michelle Norris, Randy Levine, uh, Jacqueline O'Kin Barney, and Lori Podgesil.
right. Uh, I think the clock has been set, and I guess, Wendy, we could, we could begin with you. Okay, I, I'd like to thank uh, Chairs Traeger, Salamanca, and Drum for holding these hearings today, and for all the hard work that you and your staff did in putting together this report. It really meant a lot to us who have been fighting on this issue for many years to have someone actually delve into the details of all the dysfunctional issues around school siting and planning and construction um, that we've been working on for so many years, and we really appreciate that support. In my testimony, which I will not read, it's rather lengthy, I go into all the supports that we've authored over the years, including a, a principal survey that we did in 2008, several, a report we did with the UFT in 2008, a report in 2014, and a report this year on seat loss that found that basically the, the school planning, siting, and construction process was dysfunctional on many levels. And the result has been increased overcrowding across the city and a lack of recognition by the DOE that their promises year after year, including the promises of the mayor, um, as well in speeches and in the capital plan to alleviate overcrowding, get ri rid of the need for TCUs, to get rid of split sessions, to pro provide enough space to reduce class sizes in K through three. All of these promises were made repeatedly and none of them have come true. So um, I am also thankful for a lot of the bills that were introduced today. I have specific language in my testimony about how I think each of them should be strengthened in particular ways. In particular, it's not just important for city agencies to share data on what school sites and buildings are available. It needs to be shared publicly because as I'm sure you understand, nothing happens when it's just behind closed doors with the DOE and city planning. They've had plenty of opportunity to improve their record here and it hasn't happened. We need that information presented to the city council, posted publicly, given to community boards and CECs, et cetera. Also with Ben Callis's bill, we need uh, more transparency updated annually, not just every five years, because uh, the DOE says they do it every five years. The, the, all the projections change over that time, and we need that done annually and also disaggregated by grade level. Right now, the DOE claims that there's plenty of room um, um, in, you know, because they push together elementary schools and middle schools, and they don't disaggregate that. And because of the uh, formula, uh, middle schools, many of them are considered underutilized. And so then they don't build enough elementary schools because they are using middle school space to substitute for that. And there are other things that I talk about in my testimony. And then there are a few other bills that I think flow naturally out of this report that were not um, introduced. And I'd like to just briefly go over why each one and why I think it's important. Um, one thing that was touched on during the testimony was the secret formula. It is based on data that's um, over uh, 20 years old. It has never been updated to include UP that needs to be updated, and I think the City Council has the power to force that issue, even if the DOE does not agree. The entire Euler process and rezoning, there needs to be improvements there. The thresholds are much too high, and right now in school, in areas where the schools are already overcrowded, they don't even have to consider building a new school. Um, when projects go through Euler, uh, they should also go to the CECs for comment, along with community boards, because often the CECs are much more in tune with with the actual conditions in terms of school overcrowding than community boards are. And um, one, of, one of the things that uh, we've discovered by doing research is that uh, the DOE only reports on how many seats are created each year, but not how many seats are lost. And in our reports, seats lost, though we did find that the city had created 100,000 seats, only 45,000 net seats were created, and 43,000 were, were filled by charter school students. So that is something that's absolutely necessary in order to really see whether we're making progress. Um, the housing projections need to be updated regularly and there need to be more realistic 10-year projections. In my, in my testimony, I show that the 10-year projections project zero new units to be built in the entire borough of Brooklyn between 20 20 and 2024, zero in Staten Island, and only 184 in the Bronx. I'm sure that we've already gone far beyond that, so that needs to be improved. I mean, we'll, we'll get to everyone okay, and then so, we'll circle back. All right, thanks a lot. You, thank you very much as well. Next, please. 
Good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony today about the upcoming budget. Um, I think you have seen this as well before, and so has Councilmember Drum, because I was here last year saying exactly the same thing. Um, the current budget for accessibility is woefully inadequate. At this rate, we will not exceed, exceed, uh, achieve accessibility until the year 2280. That is ludicrous. I am proposing that you budget instead of $100 million plus 27, a billion dollars over each five-year capital plan. That will bring you to full accessibility in 26 years instead of 262 years. Um, we are twisting what IDA was designed for. It was designed to keep children with disabilities in an educational environment with their peers. And what we have now is de facto segregation because they can't get in the front door of the school and often can't get even in the door for the garbage. So we need that money so that we are an integrated society, so that we're an inclusive society. And it isn't just for students. It's for teachers, it's for parents, it's for someone in this room who thinks, I'm not disabled, who suddenly finds himself with a temporary or a permanent disability and still wants to be a full participant, still wants to be a parent who's there for their child, still wants to go to school as a teacher and make a living. Um, I think it's important, the Department of Education, if you gave them all the money and said, go build accessible schools, they would. Um, I know that we didn't get a very straightforward answer when you asked, do you want more money? But I really believe if you say, here's another 150,000 a million, here's another 900 million, go make them accessible, they'll go do it. But if you don't give them the money, they sit there and say, we can't, we don't have the money for this. So you get to decide, you're our legislators, it's in your hands, please use that power so that my children can go to school across the street instead of 20 miles away, and so that my grandchildren can do the same. Thank you. Thank you as well. Thank you. Is the mic? Uh, oh, yeah, it's okay. Hi. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for letting me speak today. As you may know, my name is Jackie O'Imoni. I'm a parent for inclusive education. We work to ensure inclusive opportunity for kids with disabilities. I know, I know you heard me speak before, and I continue to I think you are more and more accessible often for kids with disabilities. I was thrilled to see that in the city council report, the CSA was a recognition of the need for more accessible schools and the recognition that, that equality doesn't exist for kids with students with physical issues. That's a huge recognition, and I applaud that. I'm also so happy to see that in the city council's proposed budget, it includes additional money for accessibility, accessibility issues. We need to ensure that that money gets into the final budget. I know last year it was in the city council proposed uh, budget, but it didn't make it to the final budget. It must make it to the final budget. We would love to work, work with you and the city council to help help ensure that money becomes a reality. As you know, I know I'm preaching to the choir, students with disabilities who have physical needs do not have the same opportunities as their peers. In a school system that prides itself for giving kids choices and giving it opportunities to choose to hone their skills in the arts, in the sciences, in the math, in whatever they want to do, there's a school out there for them. 
but not for these kids. They don't have that choice. The only choice they have, the only decision they can make is can they get through the door. There are so few fully accessible schools in New York City. Yes, there are partially accessible schools, and yes, the DOE is doing, doing their job to get the information out there at the how school may or may not be accessible, which is great. But we need more fully accessible schools. I think something like only 15% of high schools are fully accessible. And in that alone, there are eight schools. And of those eight schools, four are hard. Are Harder to get into than Harvard, and one is a transfer school, meaning you have to already be in high school to get into that school. So I know I'm out of time, and I'm going to be quiet in one second. <laughs> one second. But again, I need to urge you to, 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 for us all to do whatever we can do to make sure that you're proposed but the allocation become reality and the DOE has the mind they need to do what they need to do. Thank you. Thank, and we thank you. Uh, your advocacy and advocacy of many stakeholders here across the city uh, definitely shaped, helped shape our budget response. Of course, we know there's a lot more work to do and through we're pushing the administration to, to do a lot more as well, but accessibility was a part of the city yes. council's budget response and we were pushing the administration to do a whole lot more. Uh, thank you so much for no, that. No, thank you. I, 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 get, I, I sincerely say whatever we could do to continue pushing the issue to make sure it gets to the final budget, I urge you to ask who will help. I, I, I thank you, and it helps when you have an educator as the finance chair, educator as the education <laughs> chair, because you have an education team in, in that budget room. So, awesome. but, but thank you for, for, your, for, your, for your great work as well. Thank you. Uh, next, please. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Lori Podvesker. Uh, first and foremost, I'm a parent of a very happy and sweet 15-year-old son with developmental disabilities who attends a District 75 program on the Lower East Side. I also lead the policy work at Include NYC, and we thank you for holding this important joint hearing on the recent council report. We testify today to highlight the need for New York City Department of Education officials to focus on meeting the needs of students with disabilities in all schools as it continues to address overcrowding, space utilization of school buildings, school planning processes, and community engagement. Include NYC, formerly Resources for Children with Special Needs, has worked with hundreds of thousands of individuals since our founding 35 years ago, helping them navigate the complex special education service and support systems so that young people with disabilities can be included in all aspects of New York City life. We commend Mayor de Blasio and the Department of Education on their efforts to increase the number of schools that are partially and fully accessible to students with mobility impairments. Yet we are in full agreement with the Council's response to the Mayor's preliminary budget that it requires the DOE to reallocate $125 million within the five-year capital plan to do so. Our students with the most involved dis disabilities in District 75 are the most segregated in New York City. These 24,000 students are in dire need of more school choices so they can make meaningful connections within our schools and be fully included in our communities. Through our work, we know firsthand that too many students are being bused to District 75 programs outside of their neighborhoods and school districts due to a lack of accessible buildings and appropriate programs with available seats in the DOE district near where they live. This is particularly notable in DOE districts with a higher percentage of low-performing schools and an increased number of charter schools, such as District 17 in Brooklyn and the South Bronx. As a result, we recommend that the Department of Education does the following. Increase the number of schools that are partially and fully accessible to students with mobility issues. Increase the number of District 75 programs in high need areas. Change the current student placement process for students recommended for a District 75 program from borough-wide availability to DOE school district availability so that students have appropriate school options in the community where they live. I just want to pause for a second and explain this. And so if a student is recommended by an IEP team, to, for a District 75 program, that gets kicked to a borough enrollment officer through the Office of District 75, 
who then looks for an open seat that matches the needs, the programmatic needs. It's kind of antithetic to what the federal special education law, which Michelle had mentioned earlier, which is that a student has a right to be educated as close to home as possible with non-disabled peers. Therefore, not only is this illegal technically, it also prevents students from being integrated into the communities where they live, which is very important to kids like mine, in which they need to have those connections and natural supports and know the people where they live. And because there's a lack of programs, because of this placement process, kids are being bussed out further and further away from the, where they live. One more recommendation, which is that the Department of Ed annually publish data on the number of students with disabilities in District 75 programs who attend programs outside of the community school district where they live, disaggregated by disability, classification, and student age. Thank you. Thank you. Did you submit written testimony or you just yes. read? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you all very much. And just a very quick question for, uh, for the panel. We've heard a lot today from the administration about informal discussions they've had interagency about siting, planning, construction. Have, and, and I commend the advocates for finding fantastic data when it's available, and of course we have to get more data <laughs> from them. Um, was there any evidence that we could that we could point to that's been available to the public that they've had these informal discussions about school siting planning when it comes to building new schools? So I think in the pre-K program, when they, the city made it a real priority to find sites very quickly for thousands of, of pre-K students, I think there was collaboration and there was a lot of hard work involved. But we've seen no priority, um, no, no you know, collaboration, and no push in the same way for schools, K-12 schools. And as you noticed, uh, as council members and as parents, we've noticed that almost every single school that's built, there has to be a huge fight in the neighborhood to get it built, and then the neighborhood community members themselves have to find the site. And um, basically, the SCA told students in Sunset, uh, parents in Sunset Park, where they'd had schools funded for 20 years without being built, that the only way you get a school built and cited is if you push politically hard enough. And that's what the parents of Sunset Park did in, over the last year and a half. They had town hall meetings, they had you know, incredible political organization, and they, they, in one year I think they got four schools cited. So it always depends on political will, whether from on top or whether below. There's never an objective pro need process that then determines the outcome of a new school built in a neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you very much. We thank the um, entire panel. I know we have one more panel. Can I to answer go. that question from this perspective, from the accessibility? Thirty seconds. We, we, we have one more really, panel. Really, really fast. Just that I served on a CEC for four years, and every year we prioritized accessibility projects, and every year they weren't built. So that's a very over and over again in specific schools that needed them, where they were asked for. So I don't think, even on a more formalized basis, that they're reaching out to the communities and asking for that information. Thank you, thank you so much, and I thank the entire panel. Thank you so much. Our final panel, uh, Michael Friedman, Christina Furlong, and uh, Christine uh, Apa. Uh, good afternoon. I want to thank Mark Traeger and Danny Drum for your leadership. My name is Michael Friedman, and I am the UFT chapter leader of Pathways to Graduation, also known as P2G, a high school equivalency, equivalency program in the Department of Education's District 79, which runs the alternative schools and programs for the DOE. P2G has almost 80 sites of the day and evening programs. Each borough has at least one referral center and hub. In Brooklyn, our hub and referral center are located in the Old Boys High School at 832 Marcy Avenue in Bedford-Stuyvesant, also known as the Marcy Avenue campus. Besides P2G, there are two transfer schools on the campus, a life program for toddlers, 
a small District 75 special education program, and a charter high school. The DOE is proposing merging the two transfer schools, and they would lose one of their two floors and contracting the P2G program where the program would lose four out of 10 classrooms, would lose an administrative office and storage space. This would be done in order to add a middle school charter school in the building. This space has, in the, in the two transfer schools and P2G, given students who have dropped out of school, have many social problems, or are new to the country, a second chance in life. They have small classrooms with teachers who care about the students. The safe environment would be lost because of this proposal. It is wrong. The P2G Referral Center has served students all over Brooklyn by testing them and, counsel and counseling them as they, as they re enroll in school, or in the case of some new immigrants, enroll in school for the first time. After they are enrolled, they are placed either in P2G at the hub or at one of our sites if they are ready to pass the high school equivalency test or elsewhere in the DOE if that is in the student's best interest. The hub serves as a literacy center and ESL center and for all of the P2G students of Brooklyn as a pre-testing center for the high school equivalency test and for Br Brooklyn-wide events, which means it services almost 1,000 students throughout Brooklyn currently enrolled in P2G and has helped innumerable students in the referral center. For the students who remain at the hub, the students are given individualistic attention and creative instruction. One example is the bicycle repair program, which has taught students skills, given them jobs, and has been featured in the media, including News 12 Brooklyn. There will be a PEP vote on April 25th on this very bad proposal. If it goes through, many students will be hurt. I am asking that you use your influence to get this proposal defeated. There was a hearing by the DOE at Marcy on this proposal. I wish you could have seen the passion of the students who are afraid that they will be losing a lifeline line that will serve them in the future. They pleaded with the yes. DOE to not let this proposal go through. This must be defeated. Thank you very much. Thank you very much as well. Next. Thank you, my name is Christina Furlong. Um, I represent an overcrowded school in District 24. We will desperately miss Danny as our chair of education, but I like what I'm hearing here. Um, I was on the school leadership team there. I'd like to thank you for hosting this hearing. I also attended this hearing last year on school overcrowding, so um, I'm in about my fourth year. I would like to add the question you asked somebody else about the responsiveness of school construction authority, especially with school siting. In my experience in District 24, um, they have not been responsive, and I personally have gone out and found sites for them, and not so much has gotten an acknowledgement that it was done. I don't think the burden of finding new school locations should be on parents and council members, as we heard from Salamanca. Um, and. Johnson earlier. Uh, I feel that one aspect that's very important of this is the effect of UPK on enrollment numbers, class size, space, and siting. And I would beg city council to find a way to differentiate those numbers in districts because it's, from my very layperson perspective, throwing all things out of whack and when we're looking at seats. Um, as for programs, I took very serious offense with what um, Deputy Commissioner uh, Chancellor Rose said, like some of our highest achieving schools are some of the schools that are the most overcrowded. I cannot believe that I, I would hear that in this setting here. Um, we have a school that had 2,036 kids last year in K through five. And um, what they say is find us a space, we'll build you a new school. But I liked what you were saying about what are we doing for overcrowded schools with the students and the student body that's in there now. And I have a bunch of ideas about that that need to be taken seriously. Um, first of all, what are we not doing? The family, the Office of Family and Community Engagement um, seems to be completely ineffective in any way I've ever tried to reach out to them as a support group and feel that there needs to be an audit or a really good look at what they're doing. Um, I'm told that our school now has a wait list of 108 kids for kindergarten. 
Um, then, we, then they said, well, that's actually 10 zoned kids and 100 kids out of zone. But our zone is only eight blocks across in any direction. And our zone is divided by a different district, District 30 versus District 24. So for example, our second grade, uh, we have class size of, of 35. Every single class in every single grade, that's about 70 classrooms. They're all over 30 students. One block away from me is a school that has class size of 18 students, PS 222. I just looked at it. So that aspect of rezoning, rezoning schools needs to be taken seriously. And in the interim, schools should be unzoned. More schools should be unzoned, specifically to Danny, the new school, PS 398. If we need to be push. your final, because we have okay. a next hearing that's um, very patient already. So I also am attempting to create a new transfer status um, in Chancellor's regulations, if a school is over 140% overcrowded, a parent, if they choose, should be able to go through the same process to transfer their child to another school. And that schools that are over a certain amount overcrowded should have a second parent coordinator and other supports, extra after school programs. Because I know they understand there's a, a grant, a state grant for um, reducing class size in overcrowded schools, but it, it only is for schools that have space. But as you mentioned yourself, many schools don't have space. So. Is there a way for you to email or to, or to uh, uh, submit this testimony for us to review? Yes. And we'll follow up. And we, we appreciate this. Yes. And, and thank you for staying the, the yes. entire duration. That, that is commitment. I and thank you so to. much. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Next, please. Sure. Hi. Greetings, Chairman Traeger, Drum, Salamanca, and members of the Education, Finance, and Land Use Committees. My name is Christine Appa, and I'm a senior staff attorney at New York Lawyers for the Public Interest. I work in the environmental justice program there, and my work focuses on children's environmental health. For more than a decade, NILPI has engaged in legal campaigns to protect children from toxic exposures where they live, learn, and play. Our recent efforts include a successful lawsuit that required the city to remove all PCV-contaminated light fixtures from public schools. We've also prevailed in a suit against the School Construction Authority on behalf of the Bronx Committee for Toxic-Free Schools to ensure that remediation of a toxic site in Mox Haven followed the State Environmental Quality Review Act. I appreciate this opportunity to provide testimony on, in support of these introductions and the resolution. These legislative proposals collectively address the acute problems of school overcrowding, siting of new schools, and the need for greater public information around these related issues. We encourage the City Council to incorporate consideration of environmental contamination and remediation issues into these legislative proposals. From an environmental justice perspective, communities with lower incomes and communities of color are often both in greatest need of additional school spaces, as well as more likely to have contaminated sites. Poorly sighted schools can even have a detrimental effect on children's ability to learn and their academic performance. Well, NILPI has some specific suggestions on some of the legislation, particularly intro 757. We suggest including the New York City Department of Environmental Remediation on the task force, and we believe that incorporating the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation's Register of Contaminated Sites per intro 461 would help to streamline the transfer of information and bring a more environmentally informed perspective to the discussions. We believe that this will help to streamline the process and we also encourage the city to adopt the EPA school siting guidelines. In conclusion, NILPI supports <coughs> these proposals and encourages the city council to include precautionary measures that take environmental factors into account in the planning process. We encourage continued capital investment in maintenance and remediation and also the greening of our schools. We appreciate this opportunity to provide testimony and we look forward to working with you to make this a reality. Thank you. Thank you for your great work. Thank you so much. Next. Hi. Um, hello again. My name is Rebecca Kostuchenko. I'm the parent of a seventh grader in Brooklyn. I'm a member of the Arise Coalition. Um, I'm here to, again, this year, reiterate how badly the funding is needed for accessibility in our schools. Um, I know that you all know that. <laughs> uh, I want to restate that only 17% of our schools are accessible. 
um, that the current rate of money that's budgeted makes all schools in New York City accessible in the year 2280, which is unbelievably uh, egregious. Um, I want to just tell some personal details again. Today I brought you a picture <laughs> and a certificate. Um, my daughter's in that picture. I just wanted you to see why you always see me at these meetings. Um, she's the one in the black and white stripes on the right side. You wouldn't know that she needs accessibility, but she does. I just wanted you to see how typical she is because that's the truth of every child who needs accessibility is they're incredibly typical and they deserve to be in school with their peers. She's, I also brought you her summa cum laude certificate, which is important in seventh grade, as you know, that's high school choice, grade craziness, hunger games year. Um, she's not gonna be able to apply to probably, well, she could apply, but she probably won't be able to attend unless you suddenly build an elevator. My two top choices for her, one of them is a specialized high school, Brooklyn Latin. One is another amazing school, the I school. Um, there's a lot of other schools she won't be able to attend. Her choice will be radically different than her peers. Then her peers who maybe could work construction if they wanted to, be a dancer, I don't know, you name it, fly a plane, th plenty of things that she will not be able to do. Her brain is incredibly important to her because she can't rely on her body, nor can a lot of the other children who need excellent educations. And our high school choice system pretty much ensures that the way every other child gets to find the school that will best feed their brain, she will not have that same opportunity. And it's segregation, and it's an injustice, and it is 28 years just about past ADA. So it's a violation of her, her civil rights. Um, I wanna also just remind you that she was told she could not go to her local elementary school because it was not accessible, and I can't stress for you the importance of children who have a very physical, obvious difference of them knowing their community and their community knowing them and being able to support them. And that system in our city rends families away from their communities at the exact moment that they need them because communities are very much built around schools and local neighborhoods. She also did not get to go to the middle school that would have been best for her. I just wanted to give you personal detail today, remind you that this year I really hope that the money you're asking for, which is a pittance compared to what's needed for the years of injustice and complete ignoring of accessibility by the, by the city, that this year that money gets, gets put through to the final budget. Thank you. Uh, we, we thank you and uh, we noted earlier that in our council's budget response, to increase accessibility. Uh, we actually have $125 million in additional, in additional funds on the issue of accessibility in our schools. Um, we asked the Deputy Chancellor today on the record. Um, she didn't give us a clear answer, but this is why it's important to have an educator as the chair of our finance budget team, uh, educator here in the Education Committee, because we know this is about justice. This is about basic fairness and equity in our school system. And we, we have your back, and we're going to have to do all that we can to make sure that these funds are in this budget, knowing that there's still so much more work to do. We need more funds from the state and federal government as well. But if we have the capacity at the local level, we, ha we have to make sure that, that we do whatever is within our power and reach. So I thank you so much for your advocacy. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, and with that, I want to thank the outstanding outstanding staff of the City Council that produced this report, all the committees. We have some great folks here. Very proud to work with them. Thank you all very much. This hearing is adjourned. <laughs>